We're going to call to order the February 22nd meeting of the Capitola City Council. Can I have a roll call, please? Council Member Clark? Here. Council Member Morgan? Here. Uh, the minutes will reflect that. Council Member Peterson is absent this evening. Um, Vice Mayor Brooks? Here. And Mayor Brown? Here. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Do we have any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? Staff has no changes to the agenda this evening. Okay. Can we have a report on closed session? Good evening. A closed session was had on the item on the agenda, and no reportable action was taken. Thank you. We'll move on to additional materials. Did we receive any additional materials uh, after the distribution of the agenda packet? Yes, staff received additional materials for tonight's meeting. Staff received 20 emails and one letter for item 8A, three emails for item 8B, and one email for item 8C. All of these materials have been provided to the city council and made available for public review in the agenda packet. Thank you. We'll move on to oral communications by members of the public. This is for the public to address the council on any items not on tonight's agenda. You'll have three minutes. Please state your name if you would like it recorded correctly in the minutes. Hi, welcome. Hi, my name is Goran Klepic. I'm an Army vet. Today, around 3.01 p.m., I made a call to the CPD because I... Uh, so broken uh, beer bottles by the CVS across McDonald's. I didn't uh, know who, that, who did that, but I want to re remind the authorities here in Capitola that uh, consumption of alcohol is prohibited in open public. You have to drink alcohol inside the uh, facility like a bar or a restaurant, but you, not, you cannot drink it outside in, in public. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Take care. Thank you. I'm going to try and say less ahs tonight, folks. Uh, hello. I am John from Stronger Santa Cruz. Uh, we're a local nonprofit organization, and we're very interested in the fact that our bus stops have so little shelter and very few benches. Uh, we request that y'all direct staff to discuss with our group providing these missing benches like many municipalities have throughout the state of California and the country. Uh, we, of course, would fund all of this and do the installation. It would cost the city nothing, but this only really works if we leave these on together, sort of like what Rack Capitola does uh, when they build fences for seniors and up at Depot Hill. So thank you. Please consider it. Hello, Mayor, uh, City Council. Uh, my name is Devin Vandershaf, and I am the uh, Development and Marketing Manager at Accessible Space Incorporated, which is a national nonprofit housing and service provider for very long term adults with physical disabilities uh, based in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, ASI is the sponsor and developer of the Dakota Apartments, not too far from here, which is a 21 unit accessible and affordable apartment community for adults with disabilities, mobility impairments, and traumatic brain injuries. Uh, the Dakota was built in the year 2000 and was the dream of one of our organization's closest friends, um, a quadriplegic, uh, the late Mike Birkasset, a friend of mine, uh, who fought for accessible and affordable housing opportunities for adults with disabilities. Uh, Mike was an avid jazz lover and named the Dakota, uh, again, not far from here, after his favorite jazz club uh, that was frequented by the late artist Prince, uh, located in my hometown of Minneapolis, Minnesota. I flew out here last night, and, and quite honestly, I don't know how any of you get any work done around here. It's, it's amazing uh, compared to where I'm from. Uh, at the Dakota Apartments, uh, residents, residents excuse me, pay 30% of their gross adjusted monthly income for rent, and rent will include so sewer, trash, and heat. Uh, the units are 100% accessible and provide features uh, such as lowered and roll under countertops, uh, push pads, um, all throughout the building and custom roll-in showers to meet the needs of people with physical disabilities. Um, at the Dakota, uh, our residents uh, live in a dignified and barrier-free place to live, allowing them to work in the community and then, of course, stay out of nursing homes. Um, ASI has been working closely with 
Adi Hurley, who I just met, um, and the city. And I wanted to personally thank you uh, for taking the time and uh, working towards, uh, you know, a home application and taking the first steps to make that uh, happen. Um, you know, the, the funding would dramatically help the apartment community there, which, which is aging. Uh, it was first built in the year 2000. And like many of our buildings at ASI, it is in need of costly renovations, such as a new HVAC system, sidewalks, patios, electrical systems, and much more. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, our building does not have the revenue to cover that itself. Uh, so the home funds would go a long way to help preserve this very valuable uh, resource here in the community uh, of Capitola. I also understand that you're considering a contract tonight for Paul Ashby to apply for the State of California Home Fund Grant. So I don't want to take that off the consent agenda. I just want to make that clear. Uh, and again, thank you for your time and consideration. It means a great deal to our nonprofit organization to have your support of our mission, which is to provide housing with care around the country. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Uh, good evening, uh, uh, Mayor Brown and the City Council. Um, thank you um, for the opportunity to speak real quick. Um, I just wanted to extend my gratitude uh, for the meeting that um, uh, the mayor I held last night with Jamie, Jessica, Katie, um, and also Eric. Um, I thought it was a great meeting, and I thought it really represented and showed Capitola in a positive light. Um, it was reassuring to hear about the process and the possibility of long-range planning and rebuilding the, um, the temporary for you know temporary solutions on for coastal access services. Um, from the community perspective, there are some clear points of consensus um, that I thought we should um, hopefully get highlighted. Um, the businesses on the wharf um, hold a very dear part in the community. Um, I'm quite sure we're all aware of that. Um, no one um, questions the findings and regardings of the site conditions. I thought that was very apparent and it was a great presentation that was made. Um, and that um, no one um, urged the city to rush to reopen the wharf. Um, I think that was, um, I was afraid that might be a comment that came forward, like a rush, rush, rush. And I heard everybody was, all the comments were very positive about going through a process. Um, and um, with the part of being process, uh, being positive, I thought every in the, everybody in the community was really looking forward to a positive outcome and working through both the temporary and long term, long range planning. Um, and I know, you know, for the council, you guys have been through a lot for the last fourteen months, um, uh, as much as the city staff, and it's just well noted and appreciated. So thank you. Any further public comment? All right, seeing none, we will bring it back to staff and city council comments, and we will start with staff. I don't think we have any comments this evening. Okay, city council, any comments on this end? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to also uh, echo what Mr. Jensen said. It was awesome to see what the mayor was able to pull together. It was definitely needed and uh, appreciated by everybody that showed up. Really appreciate it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll just say it was a, a great town hall last night. Really appreciative of all the community members that showed up, the business owners. I think it was just the start of a long process that we're all going to be a part of together. Looking forward to that. All right, uh, we'll move on to uh, item seven. This is our consent agenda. It'll be enacted by one motion. Um, there's no separate discussion. Does anyone have any public comment on our consent agenda? Seeing none, bring it back to council. We can move the consent agenda. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Um, we don't need a roll call, right? Because Okay, so all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Move on to item eight, general government and public hearings. 8A is our update on the Wharf Resiliency and Public Access Project. Hand it over to Jessica. Good evening. <laughs> Here we are with this project again. Wait till Austin gets his mic. Joys of technology. I'm 
sorry. No worries. Yeah, sorry. we get rid of the note? Okay, good evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, update on the Wharf Resiliency and Public Access Project post our community meeting yesterday. Next slide, please. If anyone needs a reminder, uh, the key project elements of the Wharf Resiliency and Public Access Project is to widen the uh, wharf to be more resilient, fix some um, deferred maintenance, add a restroom, ensure the wharf's long-time resilience, and to do repairs from the January, now December 2023 storms. Uh, Cushman Contracting has been on the job since September 2023 and is working diligently to complete this project within the calendar year. Next slide. Um, so remaining scope of this project, I have widening on here, but actually I was informed that the widening was completed today. So that is one box to check off. Um, the other remaining items in the scope is to address, address the buildings, which is the bulk of our conversation this evening, but also to complete repairs to the head of the wharf, um, talk about the bathroom installation on the head of the wharf, the Portland Loo, items from the Capitola Wharf Improvement Project, and then other um, smaller items, such as our signage project that we're getting off the ground, replacing plaques, putting in the security gate, and then addressing the uh, landing and floating docks. Next slide, please. Um, so as reported two weeks ago when we were at Council, the Wharf House restaurant has some severe structural deficiencies, and we had discussed how this project, uh, this building, needed to be demolished because it's an imminent safety hazard. Next slide. What we did not discuss in detail uh, two weeks ago because we did not quite have all the assessment completed was the boat and bait shop, which also has severe structural deficiencies that was assessed by myself and our building official, but also has been confirmed with the port uh, by an independent engineer. Next slide. Here are our findings. Mr. Tim Wan is in the audience this evening. I'd like to invite him up to go ahead and uh, to these findings of these buildings. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Can everybody hear me? Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, my name is Tim Wan, and I'm a registered uh, civil engineer. I practice structural design um, independently, and uh, I've been involved with the city of Capitol in terms of repair on the Esplanade starting in the storms of 2008 and the more recent storms as well. So, I've uh, got some experience as far as the wave action and damage and, and trying to keep those structures uh, serviceable. And so then I was asked to evaluate the boat and bait shop and take a general look at the structures out there on the wharf. And uh, on the way out there, I'll notice that the wharf is coming together really well. It's looking great. And uh, that's an important element for any structure you have on it is to have a good wharf supporting it. Um, and, and upon looking at the uh, structures, they're <clears throat> 40 years old, roughly, and they've stood the test of time, but they've been exposed and, and battered. And <clears throat> in my opinion, they've reached the extent of their service life. What it would take to repair them um, would be more costly and cumbersome, and I think you'd be left with an inferior product at the end of the day versus uh, just going ahead and, and moving forward and uh, get, having better access to continue the repair on the wharf and starting with a better structure on top of that wharf. Any questions? Any questions at this point in the presentation? Or do I want to wait until the end? Okay, we'll wait until the end. Thank you so much. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, so as you know, yesterday we had a town hall that was very uh, heavily attended. Um, some of the main takeaways from that town hall was really the support of the businesses and encouraging their tenancy out on the wharf. Um, and also 
questions regarding the demolition of the buildings and the financial stability and um, disposition and implications. So we're going to get into that here in the next few slides. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the big questions that had came up prior to the meeting, but also at the meeting, was what is the chances that we can preserve these buildings where they are now in the same structures? And really, that isn't feasible. Um, they would need extensive repairs. Um, obviously, the inside one wall of the wharf house is completely collapsed. The boat and bait shop to do that repair would to be to lift the building and then work under the building. And that's just not really... While it's feasible, it's not practical. And when we do that, we'd have to address a bunch of compliance issues. There's hazardous materials concerns out there, and it's not really practical. And also, to Mr. Wan's point, it's not really fi financially reasonable as well. Next slide, please. Um, so what the demolition process involves is actually quite complicated due to the age of the buildings and then also where they are located. So the first step of the demolition process would be to remove the content. We're working with both of the tenants on this. Um, for the wharf house, it's not really safe to go in that building, so we're working on getting a third party to retrieve those items for the wharf house. And then for facilitating boat and baits content removal this weekend. Um, there are hazmat challenges that we have to deal with with the demolition process. Um, there is a uh, flammable cabinet, and there's also asbestos in the flooring material that needs to be abated before you can take the building down. Um, this demolition would be taking place under emergency permits because they are significant hazards right now. Um, we're not really able to use uh, typical demolition processes because it's not on land. It's on the uh, wharf that has weight limitations. It's a really heavy reliance on manual labor over mechanical labor to really avoid the debris entering into the ocean and then also the building collapsing because we can't really, we can shore it up, but not as well as you could if it were on land. Um, lastly, it's more complicated by the debris management because that debris has to get all the way down the wharf in something light enough where it's not going to you know, damage our brand new decking and then get into smaller dumpsters that then need to be picked up out of a narrow alley. So while it's demo, when we say demo, it's really encompassing all of these different steps in the demolition process. Next slide, please. So there's a few different approaches we can get here, there, with this, uh, with this project. The first recommended approach by staff is to do this within the resiliency project. So we're currently obtaining emergency permits. We can do that because we intend on doing this in the short term. If you wait longer, you can't get you have to get regular permits. Um, the idea would be to initiate a change order with Cushman. They are on site, they are mobilized, they have the equipment and the skills to do this type of work. Um, they would execute the demolition of the buildings, the demolition being all those steps we just discussed, and it'd be in line with the resiliency project, so they would be able to keep going forward with other items already in their scope of work while they're doing this demolition. And then up, upon completion of the demolition and repairs, they can resume work and complete the overall resiliency project. And the uh, estimated time for that would be an additional six to eight weeks to the total uh, resiliency project. Next slide. So an alternative approach would be engaged with another contractor with the resiliency project. And this also has many steps. Um, I can definitely go over these in more detail if you'd like, but just briefly, it would really um, cease Cushman's work, which would incur costs. Um, we uh, owe Cushman per our contract any delay we have in their work, we owe them money, which makes sense, right? They still have their overhead. Um, we would have to obtain new bids, and that would to cover all of the things that was included in that list for demolition. And then Cushman would also be obligated to complete work so that that contractor has access out to the buildings. So that would be also be at a cost. Uh, Cushman would also be on the hook for um, continuing to implement their environmental compliance, which we have with multiple permits on this project, which is also at a cost. Um, we would then demo the buildings. Again, the resiliency project would be on hold. Then Cushman would come back, do the repairs under the buildings, and then resume the project after that demolition. Next slide. The third and least attractive approach um, would be to defer the demolition till the end of the project. And really what that does is gives us an incomplete resiliency project because we would not be able to get to the head of the wharf or the end of the wharf because that wharf house building is dangerous to work around. So they would have to stop the project short of the wharf house restaurant. 
So what Krishna would need to do is shore up that building as much as they could so it's not as much of a immediate hazard. And then partial completion of the project, they would demobilize, we would close out our contract with Cushman, and then we'd need new engineered plans, new permits, because it's no longer really considered an emergency because we shored up the building, take it out to bid, and then mobilize a whole new contract with a new contract, and then work under our new permit conditions. And just as a reminder, when we originally permitted this project way back before January 2023, we were limited to work after the summer season. So it's likely that we wouldn't be able to do this work until October if we went this route. Next slide, please. Um, other parts of the wharf that need to be completed are ahead of wharf repairs. Um, we had damage in January and in December. Um, we had always planned on replacing all of the decking, but there are additional piles and structural elements that were damaged in both the January and December storms. Also, the landing, which is like the connection to the floating dock back up to the wharf, has deteriorated significantly, which necessitates, necessitates a significant repair. Next slide, please. Um, other items that need to be, or that are in uh, Cushman scope right now is the installation of the Portland Loo. This is a small single user restroom out on the head of the wharf. It was meant to be in between the two buildings. Assuming we demo these two buildings, they would be, it would be a floating restroom. Um, there's a potential to get a credit for this. If we do not install it, it would not be the full credit for the bid item just because it's more or less a restocking fee from the manufacturer. Um, and also there's a consideration that there was an importance of providing these facilities throughout the messaging of this project. And it was supported by dedicated funding, which we can repurpose elsewhere, but it is something that the community considered significant in the project. Next slide, please. Um, other items to be completed are all those items in the Capitola Wharf Enhancement Project. Uh, that project specifics are scheduled for consideration by Planning Commission in March. Um, staff proposes integrating the electrical and furniture components into the Cushman contract because those are things that they, types of work that they're already contracted to do. That's included in the change order proposed for, um, for your consideration this night. Other elements of that project, such as artistic elements and the fish station, are really under separate development and are uh, part of this conversation this evening. Um, additional efforts, as I said before, we have a grant. I'm not sure that we've talked about this in uh, council, but we did get a grant from the Marine Sanctuary Foundation for Educational Signage, so we're starting that project. And then also plaque replacement floating dock, the security gate that has been fabricated, all of those things still need to be completed by Cushman prior to the end of this project. Next slide, please. So the money. Um, uh, this is our proposed change order. I wanted to take it from the very beginning that we started off way below our estimated budget of $8.9 million. So with these projects, it's very common to have change orders, especially considering we had storm damage that from January that was evaluated, but you can't fully evaluate until you take the decking off. So the first three change orders were not anything out of the ordinary for a project of this size and scope. Uh, the fourth change order was for the storm damage from December of 2023. Um, so our current contract stands at $8.3 million. The proposed change order for this evening uh, includes the CWEP elements that we spoke about, the demo of the buildings, the repair work under the buildings to have a more stable wharf for both while there are no buildings there and whatever is redeveloped, may or may not be redeveloped on top of it, and then the finishing up of the head of the wharf repair. So this comes up to about $1.3 million to bring the contract for Cushman up to 10227. Um, I will say that that number between the $10 million and the $8 million figure is about a 15% increase, which is pretty typical for a um, capital improvement project. So it's not out of line of how, what you would expect for a project of this size. Next slide, please. So our project budget, um, as you may recall, we have several grants, both the state and federal government, our Measure F funds, our insurance funds, uh, CWEP fundraising. So our total project funding is 9.3. And then considering the proposed change order and then the CWIP items that are non-Cushman related, our project costs are estimated at $10.5 million for a $1.3 million project deficit. Next slide. Luckily, 
we received some news today from the state government that our $500,000 being held by state parks is going to come through. And we've already put in all of our paperwork for that to happen. So that will be a relief on the budget. Also, there's the potential for that restroom credit of two to $300,000, but 200,000 is here as a conservative estimate. Next slide, please. So this is just a kind of a summary of what we've talked about with our demolition options, the pros and cons, perhaps something to refer back to as you all are deliberating. Uh, next slide, please. Um, other uh, decisions for this evening are the Portland Lou uh, uh, installation determination. Um, after that, we still anticipate to complete this project in fall of 2023, assuming that we can move forward with the demolition process of these buildings. And then there will also be a future visioning, visioning and public process for what will go on at the wharf after this project is completed. Next slide, please. Um, there was also a question brought up about our local coastal plan and what needs to be out there and what can be out on the wharf um, in the future. This is not my area of expertise. If you have questions, Katie is up in the front row to answer them for you. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the recommendation of the staff report. Um, the amount for the budget uh, amendment was edited to um, include that money from the ooh, I'm from the state parks. So with that, I am happy to answer any questions you have. All right, thank you. Questions? You want to start at this end? Or? Yeah. Thank you for the presentation, Jessica, and um, for your work so far. This has been a lot of um, just a lot of work. So thank you first and foremost for your expertise. Um, so the million dollar question, um, I was quickly crunching some numbers and from what I understand every day, the, um, the company does not work is about $17,000, correct? As their covering costs, yes. Okay, so have we gone out to bid or gone out and um, for any other people to come and break down. This sounds really loud. Is this loud? Um, have we gone out to bid to see if we can get another quote So um, rather than the million dollars? We have asked for two other quotes. One of the, so, and they were both quotes from people or from outfits that bid the Santa Cruz wharf demolition of the Miramar in the past, I want to say year or 18 months. Mm -hmm. and so one of them has been pretty non-responsive, which is not what you want. <laughs> the other one um, did respond, but kind of as I outlined in one of the previous slides, there's a lot of costs that are kind of fixed costs related to Cushman giving them the ability to even be out there and do that work. So really the difference in cost there is is like less than a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, I mean, when I crunch the numbers, I'm looking at we need a bid to come in around five hundred thousand dollars or less because of the money we're going to lose for each day that Cushman isn't working. Is that correct? Yes, got it. Um, and it's still a lot of money, though. Yes. Um, when do you think we could get those additional quotes by? So the outfits that do this this type of work are really limited. And we received one. Mm -hmm. um, the second one, if we really push them, we could receive a response within the next week or two. But I will say that both I and the Cushman Contracting have been trying to contact them. And while they have responded saying, yes, we received your email, they have not decided to come out to the project site. OK. Um, and I'm just going to only press, because I know this is questions from our community about are there any, is there anyone else that we'd reach out to? A $500,000 deficit that we're still looking at is a significant amount of money. And so I'm just curious if there's anyone other than the Santa Cruz Wharf folks that could possibly bid the project. To our knowledge, not locally. Mm -hmm. um, Santa Cruz Wharf did publicly bid that project. The um, one that responded was their low bidder and they only received two. Okay. Those are the two outfits we've contacted. Okay. Um, Okay, those are all my questions for right now. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, thank you, obviously. Um, I guess, uh, what has there been any input about the restroom at the end of the wharf, like from last night or anything from the community of like the importance of having it? Or I'm just trying to weigh out that 200K. Not at the meeting last night, no. Okay. Okay, and then my other question was Yvette, so thank you. 
a couple questions. We can start with the, the, the Portland Lou. How much will we be losing to get that $200,000 back? Um, so on the low end, about $100,000. Yes. And it seems like no matter what we oh, yeah, sorry. put me. in there in the long term, we're going to have to have a bathroom down there sometime. So it might make more sense to have it put in while we have it and while we're doing it. And uh, thought that would losing another 100000 plus already being over 500000 That's my thought on the Portland Loom. And the second one is uh, the demolition of the buildings. How soon does that have to be done? I mean, do we have time to wait for looking for another bid, or is it going to be something that has to be done in the next couple of weeks? So there's two parts, because there's two buildings, right, to that question. Uh, the wharf house is really a hazard. Like, it, it, if we don't go and demo it, we need to go and shore it up, whatever cost that's going to be, so it doesn't fall into the ocean, and it's not really harmful to anyone who might be around the base of the wharf in the water or the workers out there with Cushman. The boat and bait shop is closer to where Cushman is working, so we could wait on that, but chances are by the time Cushman will continue with their project, so they will have passed the boat and bait shop and have to come back and redo that, redo that work. So they are approximately two weeks away from being at the base of that building. So if we did look for another bid, we'd have to do it within the next two weeks. Yes, and I will also say that you also get the bid, but then you have to line up all the contractors, right, and get into their scheduling. And so that it's not just the two weeks you get the bid and they'll be there the next day, obviously. Like, it's all there's a lot of scheduling that also goes into that. Yeah, and then lastly, I'm, I'm not an expert on demolition, but it sure seems like a lot of money for a million dollars. Have they showed us why it's going to cost that much? Yes, and we can pull up that sliding in if you would like, but it really involves not, it's abatement of hazardous materials, it's removal of a lot of the personal property, particularly in the wharf house, and then it's the fact of where it's located makes it really difficult to, one, just keep all of that debris out of the ocean, and then also take it all the way down the wharf with load constraints, and then put it in the dumpsters, and then have the dumpsters picked up from the narrow alley. And that obviously is more frequently than you would if you just had a like giant site, like land site. Okay, thank you. More questions? Yeah, I, I, it may, I was just thinking about one more question about the incentive of removing the boat and bay even sooner with Cushman. Um, I think you might have mentioned it here, or maybe I heard it last night, um, about underneath yes. and them fixing Cushman replacing some of those some of that what are they called the boards the pilings on the boards under underneath um, is that an additional cost that we're not seeing up here with the 500,000 no that is in there that is in there that extra work under the buildings um, huh? yes. is that part of the million or is that part of I, would, I can't I don't see the slide I don't know if you want to go back Austin is definitely part of the change order calculation, but I think we did break it out in the. It was a 500K. Repair oh, there it repair is. Work. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So it is point. Okay. I see it. Okay. Thank you. All right. I just had a couple questions. Um, can you talk about, forgive me, I think this is education for myself, but for anyone else who may not be aware, what does it mean to shore up a building? So it means to keep it from collapsing. Oh, what does that entail? Sure, you have to do that from the outside. So actually, I think Mr. Wong could probably, if you want, like, actual details. <laughs> but um, basically, you need a bigger footprint than the building is. And then you actually, if, if, you, if you don't mind. <laughs> Hello again. So shoring it up, what you need to do is make sure that it's safe to work around. And so it would be probably a series of braces or other means of holding up any walls or anything else to try to work around there safely. How that would be done, you know, it'd take some time to figure out exactly what it would be. But the term shoring up basically just means keep it held up where nobody's going to get harmed by it. Okay. And you said that involves a, a big footprint that would prevent us from being able to even get to the end of the wharf. Well, it would, so in terms of how you might attempt to brace it, maybe you would attempt to brace it from the inside. There's different ways of doing it. But as you start thinking about what you're up against here, there's time. And the fact that you want to get this wharf rebuilt and get it as solid as you can make it. 
And so the any savings or any time that you might have by taking time to figure out all these different things could cost you in the long run. And that, you know, shoring that up to do sort of a minimal job to make your way to the end of it, in, in my opinion, is that would be where I would say it's worth paying for the demolition. And again, she's addressed the nuances of getting contractors, but I mean, I'm involved in building and see how difficult it is to get people to show up and the time that it takes and the delays that you might be looking at, whereas you have a, a, a contractor that's on site right now and that, you know, you certainly want to look at any potential savings of having them mobilized versus, you know, telling them to sit back while you wait for somebody else to mobilize and get in the way of the guys doing the work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank Beyond you. your question about shoring, but, you know. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, there was a talk about the bathroom being supported by dedicated funding. Is that city funding or CWEP funding? No, that's actually part of the HUD funding. Oh, okay, good. So, so we have had a conversation with them about that can be allocated elsewhere. Okay, perfect. Good, good, good. Um, there, We received an email about how some of the um, CWEP funded uh, uh, additions will be installed by Cushman, but the, the rest of them weren't included. And so my understanding is that that doesn't mean they won't be included. They just won't be installed by Cushman. Can you speak to that? Correct. So there's um, two of the more significant parts of that project are artists um, for the entryway and then also, if you might recall, these bronze fish that will be inlaid into the wharf. Those are completely separate. Those have different artist contracts. Those are being developed under other public outreach efforts. Um, and so, yes, those are have dedicated funding and are moving forward just separately from this main resiliency project. Okay. And then um, how long does a demolition usually take? One building. It's a good question. So the quote that I got from Cushman was six weeks to two months for both. For both. For both. But they were also going to do them at the same time. So for if you sure. to do one building, I would guess would be at least six weeks. Sure. Okay. So so if it if we were full speed ahead, they they saw no problems. They could get both buildings down in six weeks. If it takes six longer for I'm sorry. Six to eight. Six to eight. Yes. Yeah. Six to eight. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. I think those are all my questions for now. Any additional questions before we go to public comment? Okay. All right. We will open this item up for public comment. If there's any member of the public that would like to address uh, the council on this item, now is the time. Hello. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Jerry Jensen. Um, just, um, and just regarding the cost of um, the million dollar change order, I think if we highlight um, at just the direct cost of doing the demolition, um, looking at that number and talking to other local contractors in the area and um, understanding what the nuances of the wharf and what the hazardous waste and stuff, I personally feel, and this is just as a community member, that number is excessive. Um, and I would strongly encourage that we have a secondary number just so that as we all look at that number and say it's a million dollars, um, that we have a, a way to verify what that number really is. Um, I know, um, you know, there's obviously opportunities of having remobilization and stuff like that, but I think being accountable to the community and having that excessive cost should probably be looked at. Um, the second part of the change order that, um, well, first of all, let me talk about the bathroom. I'm, I would just question I thought I was told that the bathroom was part of state funding it was like mandated it had to be a part of the approval process so maybe there's ways because the wharf was damaged that that bathroom could be removed and uh, regarding the comments I have heard comments about that bathroom that it wasn't the most sightly bathroom so if it, personally if it wasn't um, at the end of the wharf and um, before it was going to be kind of let's say camouflaged by two buildings and now if there's not going to be any buildings I think that would really stand out like a sort them so um, and then just my last comment, just regarding um, the furniture and equipment items um, of the $313,000. Um, I completely understand that there's some electrical part of that portion that might be for Cushman, but uh, some of these items are just about strictly procurement. So benches, tables, trash cans, and also procurement of just the light fixtures. And um, it might just be something, another way of looking at if we're trying to look at when we have a $500,000 deficit, um, that there might be ways of procuring just at least the F&E items 
of, you know, like I said, the benches and tables stuff that you really don't need a general contractor to procure those. And also it might be a different way. Of, um, those can be installed maybe at a later date, not by the contractor itself. Um, but I would be in completely agreement with the electrical and the infrastructure portion of that project being put in. So that's all I have, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Additional public, oh, additional public comment? Austin, can we get the floor? Good evening. I feel like I'm, um, this is kind of deja vu. I was among the hundreds of people who were here last night listening to um, what I thought were suggestions and comments from the public with the hopes of, of saving those two structures or saving the, saving the wharf house and saving the boat and bait uh, portion. Um, it sounds now, to, I wish that you had this, all this information last night for these hundreds of people to hear because it sounds very much like this is already a fait accompli or it's a done deal. And there definitely was not that impression last night. I think people came to speak out and explore options other than demolition, costs, questions about the local, uh, the um, local coastal plan, about money and other alternatives. Now, tonight, it's a totally different discussion. So this is, it sounds like it's a done deal and all those passionate public comments about how important these structures are and how important this wharf is and how important the ability to have the boat and bait shop out there seem like it was all for naught. So I have to say I'm, I'm frustrated and I'm disappointed and I'm speaking for literally hundreds of people who were here last night speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Hi hey guys, I'm John. I'm a Capitola resident. Ah, uh, so there's an ah. Uh, I gotta get that down. My, I've, I have a question, maybe you won't answer it. Uh, it sounds like part of the money that this 1.3 million is additional funds being given to CWEP. Is this on top of the $250,000 that we gave to CWEP in December? Or is this a part of that $250,000 we gave to CWEP? Uh, and my other just, Piece of advice would be don't put cars on the wharf. Whatever you do there, no world-class wharf in any coast, really in Europe, in Asia, anywhere you go, world-class wharfs that are real wealth creators for their communities and are beloved by citizens and visitors alike never have cars on them. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Okay, seeing none, we will bring this back to council. I first want to address many of the photos that you showed and the slides that you have tonight were from last night's presentation, correct? Correct. All of the slides at the inside and outside of the building are the same. Okay. And and I I want to I kind of want to address something and then we'll I'll let this to go to council and I'll I'll save my comments for the end, but I feel like there is kind of a bit of a choice that needs to be made that I think that we need to address this kind of elephant in the room is that there is the option to potentially, quote unquote, save the buildings, even though they're essentially unsavable. Um, and doing something along those lines will significantly increase the amount of time before anyone who is running a business could potentially get back out onto the wharf and continue their business, is that correct? Correct. So if our intention is to save the buildings, that's one intention, but if our intention is to support the businesses, it's likely going to be at the expense of the buildings, and I think we need to consider that. Okay, uh, comments, we'll start at this end. And it's not really plausible to save the buildings. It, it, we have to complete the structure of the wharf, and it has to be sound, and if we try to save the structures, we're just putting a band-aid on it. So that's, that's also one of the biggest reasons why we have to demolish the buildings. I, I thought that was relayed last night. I thought it was relayed pretty well by staff, and I, and I believe that. 
Yeah, I, I will speak to that. I think at the core of this big issue, um, obviously there's a lot of emotion and history and that's totally understandable. Um, but this project started as the Wharf Project and that is kind of, in my mind, what's in the forefront is to make this wharf as resilient and as strong as it can be to hopefully not have to be up against these types of problems in the near future. Um, so that's why, in my mind, creating a more resilient wharf is becoming more important, um, even though these structures do hold dear in all of our hearts and memories and families and history. It, um, it's the, the numbers, the timing, everything is sort of ringing true that we need to push forward and we need to make sure that moving forward, we're doing it in a stabilized way. And um, while I, I do hear the public and, and I did think that a lot of information was portrayed properly last night, but maybe not. And, and so I'm sorry if people are feeling like the wool was held over their eyes or anything like that. That's obviously not our intent. That's why we held the meeting to begin with. Um, but those are just my thoughts on moving forward. I want this project to get complete. I want us to have an open wharf, um, you know, within a year. Like that just sounds amazing. Um, and yes, that's how I'm feeling. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to echo that it was really clear last night what was presented to um, to the group, and I was happy to see that the owners were sitting side and by side with our mayor um, and our staff, who who have had a lot of conversations over the past few months, or gosh, year since the first storm, because it's been a hard go, um, and we've had two experts come in to assess those buildings. Um, where there's not even a Band-Aid option. They are unsafe for anybody, especially that wharf house. Um, so I, I've been lucky enough to talk to a lot of folks who have built, who built some of those buildings and have put a lot of love, um, who are in agreement that this is, a Band-Aid option is not an option, especially from what they've observed and with these experts here on our staff and from the person that came in today. So um, that's really important to share with the community. It's not safe for the public. Um, in addition to that, I think moving forward is what can we envision after they are removed and what's next? And that is going to be an opportunity for our community to come forward and offer that input when we get there and when we can figure out how to get past this $1 million question for tonight. But I, I heard from staff and from the community that they want to have a say in the development of what's to be on the wharf for those buildings. And we most 100%, if I'm up here, we're all up here, we will make sure that happens. There's no doubt in my mind. So, um, but we're not there yet. And um, when we rebuild, because we will, we will have that opportunity and we will invite all of you there. Um, so, but what's heavy, what's, I still can't get over the million dollars, I'm going to be honest. As a council member, I believe that we have to do our due diligence in asking for another um, person to come in. And I know, Jessica, you said you've asked. It would be really nice to have that um, third option or something that we can see in writing to be transparent with the community, too, that we're doing our due diligence and how we're spending our money. Um, like I said, I did the quick calculations. That bid's going to have to come in significantly lower for it to make sense to um, put Cushman on hold at $17,000 a day. So I'm hoping, I'm praying that there's some magical, like our community member said, that there's some magical person out there, company out there who can do the job right. It's not a contractor that's going to do the job, though. It's the professionals that need to come in. Um, so I'm hoping. And so my thought is, how quickly can we get that information? Because I do not want that wharf house to fall into the ocean, and we don't have time, or nor do we want to spend the money to shore up the building. Um, could we do a closed session, not a closed, um, a special meeting uh, to look at other options um, separate from the Cushman $1 million bid? Yes. Oh. Short answer. Yes. I will say, as described in, this, in the uh, presentation, that there are fixed costs where Cushman is involved in this. So it's, there's no getting away from Cushman being involved with the demo work. There's fixed costs to deal not only with pausing their project, but also to do with like what work they have to do to get another contract out there. And, and I want to stress, 
I trust our staff 100%. I, what I'm hoping for is to be proven wrong. But I, as a, an elected, need to ensure my job is to do du the due diligence, is to see up there and so our community can see that Cushman's a, a million, that other person's 1.2 million after Cushman charges us and those other pieces, and the third option is X, Y, and Z. I think it's going to just help the community understand where those dollars are going. Um, but I have full confidence in you, and I want to be really clear about that. Um, once, I'd let, so is that, a, I, I can move forward, uh, move on from that real quick, because that bathroom, that ugly bathroom. Um, when we rebuild, hopefully very soon, when we get FEMA money, um, just planting out the seed for those FEMA people listening, um, could we build a bathroom into that, into our rebuild? Yes, all the utilities will be capped at the end have of the it, right? They're still being run. Okay. I will also say that restroom, that particular restroom was selected because they were in between two buildings and there was limited space. When we had the building. So to Council Member Clark's point, we will still have a bathroom, hopefully with the rebuild and a prettier one. Um, the timing, I think that's just another question. I think a lot of us are like, this feels really fast. We're tearing down. We got to make decisions about being rebuilding, we're not there, and I want to be clear, clear to the community about that, but in addition to just our regular timeline, so these will be demoed, we have interested parties of wanting to come back and do stuff when we reopen the business owners I'm speaking of, I heard them last night, say that they're interested in coming back, or at least one of them, um, which I'm interested in seeing that. Um, when that happens, though, all of this will align with our normal timeline. Are we still on, based off of the last storms, on the same timeline of reopening the wharf? So if we move forward with Cushman doing the demo, yes, that will be done in the fall. If we have, if we do bring in another contractor, that does delay the project. And okay. so I would say that would be closer to three to four months rather than the six to eight weeks. I, and so I guess I'll look at council you know, I don't, do you, and you think you can get us the information by, in like a week? I would recommend by, by like Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to delay. I'm, I'm, my concern is for the business owners and, and so I want to make sure that we continue this so that this project can get finished and they can find opportunities to, to reopen a business. Mm -hmm. I think we have one price, right, from one of the contractors we know who did the work on the Santa Cruz Wharf. The other one has been unresponsive. So we can hold a special meeting on Tuesday and we can keep leaning on them. But. Yeah, and then we'll see the prices, all three of them, hopefully. The one that responded didn't give a price yet. They just said we got your email or they gave us a price. So the price that they provided to myself and Cushman, when you add in all of the work that Cushman has to do to get them out there, the difference was less than $100,000 for the cost of that work. That doesn't consider the holding costs for Cushman not doing their work while this work is going on. And that $17,000 a day at like two weeks is like close to $250,000. So technically it would be more. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then the other bid, so far we haven't been able to get a response out of them. So I just want to be clear, we can continue to, beat on them yes. and try, um, but we may or may not have that by Tuesday. And, and I'll just stress to council, I just feel like this is my personal due diligence as an elected to be transparent to the community about the costs, because um, it's a lot of money and it brings us over over um, budget. So um, it makes sense why it's more, 100%, and we're, um, we're locked into the Cushman uh, contract anyways, but... Um, I would like to see a special meeting and see what comes out as of Tuesday. It doesn't slow us up too much. We can still open in the fall if we're just up till Tuesday making a decision and the Wharf House will not fall in the ocean. That's a two-part question. I cannot guarantee the Wharf House will not fall into the ocean. Darn it. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I want to go back to the CWEP stuff. I'm a bit confused. I don't know if we can pull the slide up because I heard comments from the, the audience and... I'm just not tracking. Um, what I'm hearing the community members say is, if Cushman doesn't put down the benches, we save money if someone else does that. Is that what I am hearing? And do you think that's true? 
So the um, C Web Cushman construction, 313,000, if they just did the electrical and things like not the benches, is that a significant savings? Is it worth your time? I mean, it's also your time of renegotiating all those things. So significant, probably not. I will say that while it is like something we can order benches, we can order lighting, or not lighting fixtures, but we can order viewers, that kind of thing. They also have to be ordered. You have to like schedule the delivery. You have to store them somewhere. You have to assemble them and you have to install them. Mm -hmm. So that all comes at a cost that probably is not the best use of funds and time of our crew. And so that would be a separate contract that we would bid. And that would definitely need to be a project that follows this resiliency project. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think we're in our last meeting with CWEP presented, they were clear that once the money came to us that we were going to be able to complete this project at, at council's discretion with some input from them. Um, and hearing from staff, this seems like the most pragmatic way approach to using the dollars at this time. Um, for tonight, I guess my last point is if we move forward with CWEP, Cushman Construction, repair work under the buildings and head of wharf repair, we can make that particular motion today and just table the building demolition to the special meeting on Tuesday. Is that sound right based off of what's on the agenda tonight? Yes, I just think that would result in a, well, Yes, it would result in an additional change order for Cushman later because we could do this change order for those items, but then with the demolition, there would still be cost incurred with that either way, either if Cushman does it or not, and we'd do an additional change order. And it's just a few days, I guess that's just uh, the on, on Tuesday. Um, and then the bathroom, we have to figure out just not putting it out there would be my personal opinion for now because um, I think there's other opportunities. So, yeah, I'm done. All right, um, you know, I'll share, I do think it's important that we prove to our community that we're doing our due diligence by getting additional bids, um, but I really don't wanna, I really don't wanna hold up the opportunity for our business owners to work with the city and the community in finding ways to get some kind of temporary facility out there while we're continuing the long-term planning for facilities on the wharf, and so I, I I, Tuesday would be like as long as I want to push it. So if we can do a special meeting on Tuesday, I'm okay with that. Um, and yeah, if we could just continue to try to get bids. Um, my understanding is that there's only, what, two contractors in the state that do this kind of work out on water? Two locally. Two locally. That have okay. bid for the Santa Cruz, that bid for similar work on the Santa Cruz floor. Okay. And how, do we have any idea how many are in the state? No. Sorry, I do not. Yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't expect you to. I was just curious. Okay, uh, I also want to, I just want to point out, uh, and while I'm speaking, sorry, Austin, I was just about to ask you to pull up a slide. Um, will you pull up that slide that had the next step summary slide? It was for, for our deliberation. And in the meantime, I really want to take a moment to point out that that grant that we got for the educational signs, that our vice mayor fought very hard to get that grant, and credit is, is due in that regard. That's the one. Okay. Um, Yeah, okay. I, I am happy with moving forward um, with a special meeting on Tuesday to further uh, consider any grants that were, or excuse me, to further consider any bids that were received, um, to additionally consider the bid that we have from Cushman. Um, council, if you're okay with it, I say let's just save all of this, the rest of these items until Tuesday as well, the bathroom and the, what was the third item? Is that it, the bid in the bathroom? I will say the bathroom, if you are leaning towards not installing that, the sooner we let the manufacturer know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so then we'll start by uh, entertaining a motion then. Oh, city manager. Just one detail I want the council to be aware of. Our public works director has another public meeting. She is running for the Cliff Drive project that evening. So you will be getting uh, your city manager pretending to be a public works director that evening presenting the information. Just you trust her ability to, to train you on the right things to say. <laughs> okay, um, so in that case, I think that um, I would personally like to see a special meeting on Tuesday. Um, 
we understand from staff that they would like to hear from us on the bathrooms this evening, or at least that it would be best if they do. So we will entertain a motion if anyone has a motion to be made. Um, sure. I also just want to add in closing that there is an opportunity for our community to give feedback right now on the kiosk that um, Mayor Brown was just talking about. Um, the information is found on our website, I'm guessing, and um, circulating on social media where you can talk about what educational materials regarding the Monterey Bay Sanctuary you'd like to see on the kiosk. Um, with that being said, I'd like to make a motion to happily return the silver porta oh, porta Porta Lou, Porta Lou to the manufacturer. <laughs> do, you want to include anything about continue, do we need to include anything about continuing the other items next Tuesday, or is that just direction to staff and we can just vote on this one thing? Go ahead. I will second that. No, no, I'm I'm sorry. I mean, for this motion right now, do we need to make a motion to continue to to have a new meeting, or because this the action the recommended action is on the bid, and we're not taking action on the bid. I think, I think the direction is sufficient. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Uh, did I hear a second? I will second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We will move on to item 8B, Bay Avenue and Hill Street traffic safety update. Hello again. Again. <laughs> Oh, well, Austin gets the slides up for this one. I will give the uh, council a little bit of a reminder how we got here on this project. Um, so in September of 2023, staff brought options um, for improvements to the Bay Hill intersection. It was one of your council goals for the fiscal year. Um, on November 29th, we held a community meeting regarding this intersection. And then we were directed by council to, for you all, to form an ad hoc subcommittee of Councilmember Clark and Councilmember Peterson and do directed outreach to the property owners of this corner and then also to the uh, senior Bay Avenue senior housing. So over the past two months, we've gone out and done those things. We have reconvened with the subcommittee and drafted uh, recommendations for a um, refined design for improvements to the Bay Hill intersection. So to get into all of the details of this uh, project, we have Kimley Horn this evening, uh, Derek Wu and Frederick Venter, and they will be giving the presentation on what we've been up to. Great, hi, thank you. Hello. Um, good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council, everybody attending tonight's meeting. My name is Derek Wu, and I'm a project engineer with the consulting firm Kimley Horn. Also in attendance with, from Kimley Horn is Frederick Venter. We're here to present our traffic analysis for the proposed safety improvements at Bay Avenue and Hill Street intersection. Next slide. The primary objective of the project was to determine feasible quick build improvements at the Bay Hill intersection to improve multimodal safety and operations. The traffic analysis that Kimley Horn and city staff conducted was to determine the following, gather community input and feedback through public outreach, utilize the existing travel lanes to provide crossing improvements for bikes and pedestrians, enhance bike and pedestrian access and safety and visibility at the intersection, and finally maintain a balance to provide acceptable vehicle tra traffic operations through the corridor. Next slide. So to address these goals and objectives, we will be presenting the existing conditions, review the various traffic calming measures to improve the intersection, summarize the outcome of the public outreach conducted, review the preferred quick build uh, design alternatives, and finally discuss the next steps and council direction. Next slide. Uh, this slide is an overview map showing the project study area and the existing conditions. The Bay Hill intersection circled in red is currently an always stop controlled and provides direct access to the Knob Hill Shopping Center and the Risbon uh, Pedestrian Bridge Crossing Soquel Creek. Other major intersections nearby include Highway 1 ramps and uh, the Capitola Bay Stop Controlled Intersection. The intersections at Crossroads Loop, Center Street, Oak Street are stop controlled on the minor approaches. And also the Bay Avenue Senior Housing Apartment Complex is located nearby and there are many active residents that cross Bay Hill intersection on a daily basis. Next slide. In transportation engineering, one of the primary metrics that is analyzed is what's called level of service. 
So level of service is a term that describes the operating condition of an intersection using a ranking scale from A to F. The level of service standard in the city along Bay Avenue is level of service D, which represents conditions between stable traffic flow and complete vehicle congestion. So level of service measures the average uh, intersection delay per vehicle. And one important note is that level of service does, is not a measurement of safety. Next slide. So the existing intersection level of service along Bay Avenue is summarized here. The level of service results in orange is the morning AM peak hour, while the purple shows the level of service during the PM peak. The Bay Hill intersection is currently operating at level of service C. Next slide. So the existing lane geometry at the Bay Hill intersection consists of two travel lanes in each direction along Bay Avenue with a center left turn lane. For the Knob Hill driveway, there are two inbound lanes and two outbound lanes. And in the center of the road, there are two small raised medians that provide signage along the pedestrian crosswalk. The multiple vehicle lanes at the intersection creates multiple turn conflicts that drivers, bicyclists, and pedestrians need to watch out for when crossing the intersection. And at night and during peak traffic, visibility to see all the potential conflicts is limited. In addition, the crossing distance on Bay Avenue along is long and pedestrians are exposed to up to five lanes of vehicle traffic. These challenges make it difficult to cross the intersection safely. Next slide. In fact, the Bay Hill intersection currently has nine vehicle entry lanes and over 41 conflict points, which is more than a typical stop controlled intersection. The multiple vehicle lanes cause you know, conflict points uh, between vehicles, bikes, and pedestrians crossing the intersection creates confusion of who has the right of way and who is next to cross. And as a result, it causes a higher probability of accidents. Next slide. So although the intersection currently operates at acceptable level of service for vehicle operations, there have been several accidents over the years caused by unsafe driving behavior. Between November 2017 and December 2023, there are approximately 12 uh, total vehicle collisions that occurred at the Bay Hill intersection. Three of the 12 accidents were pedestrian-related injuries, with the primary collision factor being cars failing to yield at the intersection. Other primary collision factors include unsafe speeds, improper turns, and not yielding to other cars on the road. Next slide. So here's a graphic that shows where the different accidents took place at the Bay Hill intersection. The three pedestrian accidents occurred at the crosswalk at Bay Hill. So based on the collision data, there are potential safety concerns at this intersection. The proposed improvements at Bay Hill being presented tonight aim to enhance bike and pedestrian safety and reduce vehicle speeds through traffic calming. Next slide. So one of the reasons why traffic calming is proposed is to enhance bike and ped access and safety along Bay Avenue. To achieve this, reducing vehicle speeds is one of the main traffic calming goals and is a significant factor in roadway safety. As vehicle speed increases, the likelihood of, of a fatality during a collision also increases. As shown in this graphic, the chance of a pedestrian being killed from a vehicle collision significantly increases between 20, 30, and 40 miles per hour. As you can see in the red, a pedestrian has a 10% chance of dying in a 20 mile per hour collision. However, a pedestrian has an 80% chance of dying in a 40 mile per hour collision. So to improve bike and pedestrian safety, the proposed improvements aimed to calm traffic and reduce average vehicle speeds at the intersection. Next slide. So the proposed improvements for the intersection is to implement curb extensions and a road diet traffic calming measures. These features convert some of the vehicle travel way into a cross section with fewer or narrower vehicle travel lanes. The reduction in travel lanes are re repurposed to allow space for additional pedestrian, bicycle, or transit improvements. And the curb extension pushes the pedestrian refuge area into the street, and these can either be permanently hardscaped or temporarily striped with bollards or planters. Both the curb extension and the road diet calming measures reduces vehicle speeds and shortens the crossing distance for pedestrians. The sharper turn radius and narrow road forces vehicles to slow down, which improves pedestrian safety. Next slide. So this slide shows some examples of quick build and road diet curb extension improvements at an intersection using colored paints, uh, planters, raised bollards. Compared to a traditional hatch or striping pattern, adding colored decorative design increases driver awareness, is more aesthetically pleasing, and creates more positive community input and reaction. Next slide. 
In addition to curb extensions, separate striping and space to provide both bike and ped crossings would also improve visibility and access at the intersection. The photo on the left is a striping example in downtown San Jose. And the photo on the right is the current crosswalk striping by the Capitol Library at Wharf and Clears. Next slide. So another way to improve visibility is upgrading the existing signs with flashing LED lights. These types of signs are solar or battery powered, and the lights on the outside order of the sign flash throughout the day to alert drivers of upcoming traffic control. It should be noted that in January, the city installed LED flashing stop signs at, this, at the Bay Hill intersection. Next slide. So in the past few months, Kimley Horn and city staff conducted public outreach with the local community to gather feedback on the intersection and propose quick build options. For this project, the design team held subcommittee meetings with several council members and held outreach meetings with the adjacent property owners. On January 31st, the design team also held a public workshop at the Bay Avenue Senior Housing Community to make sure the project can address the needs and concerns of the active residents that live near and travel through this intersection. City staff also communicated with representatives from the RTC Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee. Slide. So from the various public outreach meetings, summary of the general comments and feedback from the community are shown here. The community is supportive of the quick build project and the various traffic calming measures to improve bike and pedestrian safety at the intersection. The community supports a solution that does not significantly impede access to neighboring properties. And the community supports a solution that does not significantly impact vehicle operations. For these concerns, a traffic analysis was conducted for the quick build options. And also as a result, the community is supportive in a reduction of vehicle operations to improve road safety for all users. The final comment that was raised several times was a need to improve existing street light conditions along Bay Avenue. The quick build project will implement retroflective materials to enhance visibility at night. However, due to the scope and limited budget of the quick build project, street lighting would be a future long-term improvement along the corridor. Next slide. The city is planning to implement these improvements as a quick build project. So quick build projects are reversible adjustable traffic safety improvements that can be installed relatively quickly. And unlike major capital improvement projects, which may take years to plan, design, and construct, quick build projects are constructed within weeks or months and are intended to be evaluated and adjusted after construction. The advantage of a quick build project is that it gives the public an opportunity to test run the improvements and provide more active feedback. And then depending on that feedback, there is potential for the quick build improvement to become a permanent installation or serve as a temporary interim solution that would be changed later in, in a future roadway design. So quick improvements are planned with the ex expectation that it may undergo changes after installation. So therefore, they are built using materials that allow changes to the layout. An example of temporary objects that can be used to create the improvements include bollards, paints, fencing, and signs. Next slide. So overall, the design team analyzed and presented three different quick build options to the community. Option one, shown on the left, simply enhances the existing signs and pavement markings along Bay Avenue. Option one would not alter the intersection geometry or negatively impact vehicle operations. However, this option provides the least improvement to enhance bike and pedestrian safety. Option three on the right maintains the existing four lanes on Bay Avenue, but the existing left turn lane at the intersection is converted into a painted median with raised bollards to create a bigger pedestrian refuge in the middle. This option provides a slightly better bike and pet improvement compared to option one. However, from the option shown here, the preferred intersection improvement for the Bay Hill intersection is option two, road diet concept, which changes the intersection geometry to provide the greatest improvement to bike and pedestrian safety. Next slide. So option two consists of a road diet and curb extension improvement that narrows the vehicle travel lanes on Bay Avenue from four lanes to two lanes. In the Bay Avenue southbound direction, the outside vehicle lane is restriped into a right turn lane uh, into the Knob Hill and Car Wash driveway, and the roadway transitions into a road diet with one travel lane with a painted curb extension. In the Bay Avenue northbound direction, the road is striped with one travel lane between Center Street and Hill Street. At the Hill Street and Knob Hill driveway approaches, the travel lanes are narrowed with the painted curb extensions to reduce the number of conflict points between pedestrians and other vehicles. Slide. So 
comparison purposes, the image on the left is the existing lane geometry at the Bay Hill intersection. Next. And on the image on the right is the, the proposed option two improvements. With this option, the existing class two bike lanes on Bay Avenue would be augmented with stripe buffer to provide greater separation between the vehicle travelway and would be enhanced with green bike striping within the intersection. The existing raised medians in the crosswalk would remain. And at the Knob Hill driveway, vehicle lanes are narrowed and reconfigured to have one entry lane and two exit lanes to shorten the crosswalk distance and reduce the number of conflict points at the intersection. At each intersection corner, the roadway width would be reduced with decorative paint and delineated with flexible bollards at the edge is to slow the turning speed of vehicles and enhance bike and pedestrian visibility at the crossings. This proposed cross section would essentially shorten the pedestrian crosswalk distance from five lanes to three lanes, so peds are less exposed to oncoming traffic compared to the existing condition. For the quick build option two, implementing the road diet features would provide the greatest improvement to bike and ped safety compared to the other options. The trade-off for this option, however, is that reducing the vehicle travel lanes with the road diet would result in greater impacts to vehicle level of service and longer vehicle queues. Next slide. So a traffic analysis for the quick belt options was conducted to compare the level of service and queues. The level of service reported is the average intersection delay for vehicles, and the vehicle queue reported is the 95th percentile measured in the number of cars. So this slide shows the vehicle operations during the morning commute. Under existing conditions, with no changes to the intersection geometry, the level service is C in the AM. With option two road diet, the intersection vehicle delay increases to level service D, and the average vehicle queues along Bay Avenue increase by one to three car lengths. Next slide. During the midday traffic commute, the level service for the option two road diet would operate at level service F and vehicle queues are expected to increase by about one to three vehicle car lengths along Bay Avenue. Next slide. And finally, during the evening commute, the level service for option two road diet would operate at level service D, and the vehicle queues are expected to increase again by about one to two vehicle car lengths. Next slide. So this summary table compares the existing intersection condition and the different quick build options that were analyzed. Each option was evaluated based on these criteria, bike and ped safety and visibility, a pedestrian crossing exposure, intersection level of service, and impact to vehicle queues. For the existing condition, there is low bike and ped safety and visibility since the intersection has a very high total of 41 conflict points and peds are exposed to five lanes of traffic when crossing Bay Avenue. However, the existing intersection is operating at acceptable level of service and vehicle queue lengths are generally low. For option one, adding signing and striping improvements would only provide minor improvement to the bike and ped visibility within the intersection. However, it number of conflict points and the ped crossing exposure to traffic would not improve compared to what is out there today. This option would not impact or change the existing tra traffic operations for vehicles. For the preferred option two, implementing the road diet features would provide the greatest improvement to bike and ped safety and visibility since the number of Conflict points would be reduced and the ped crossing exposure would be reduced to three lanes of traffic with the curb extensions. Trade off again that I mentioned earlier is that reduction in lanes will increase um, vehicle level service and provide longer queues along Bay Avenue. And then for option three, implementing the median features would provide some level of improvement to bike and pet safety um, and reduce a few conflict points. However, this option does not have the same level of safety improvement as option two. Next slide. So the next step of the project is to implement short-term improvements. For tonight's meeting, we are seeking input and direction from council on the quick build options. Once a preferred design is approved, the city would use general funds to construct the quick build improvements and evaluate the traffic conditions and collect community feedback for any feasible changes. The long-term plan of this intersection is to conduct a safety study to determine future roadway improvements along the corridor. These future improvements would consist of permanent hardscape and geometry changes and would take place several years out. For these long-term plans, the city would continue to pursue potential grant and funding opportunities. So this concludes our traffic presentation on Bay Hill. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, questions? Questions at this time? No? Questions? Okay. <laughs>
so many questions for you. Um, okay, so at the beginning of your presentation, you shared that these LOS are not for safety. You had a slide. Can you just give me a little bit more information about what you mean by that? Good evening. My name is Frederick Venter. Um, so LOS is a measure of delay for vehicles at the intersection. All it measures is how long a vehicle waits once it arrives at the back of a queue or at the star bar to cross the intersection. Um, so there's not a measurement of safety at all. It's only vehicle operations. Okay. Um, you mentioned we you looked at a six-year assessment of our um, of our unfortunate car crashes and such, which averaged out to about two a year at the intersection for all of those points of conflict. Is that average for something like that? Just not to say it's just two, but is that average for that kind of intersection? It's a very difficult question because there's so many characteristics that play a role in how the intersection operates. From a safety perspective, one accident, if we go for a vision zero concepts that is promoted by the state right now is to go for zero accidents. What is worrisome is all the pedestrian accidents because those result in injuries um, and death, um, which has a much bigger effect, right? If it was only vehicle accidents, one could probably say it's okay, but uh, I'm very concerned about the pedestrian accidents. Um, in the, the options you showed, are, do any of them include larger, wider bike lanes? It's a heavily um, used intersection for our students going to and from school? So we do not include, well, the, the bike lanes go to between five and six feet, right? But what you will see in those um, layouts is where we have buffers, right? So there is a better separation through the intersection between vehicles and the bikes, which you don't have now. I see. There's, that's right. Okay. Um, and in all, in all of the options, um, you or excuse me, actually, this is more for staff, with the, the property owners around, because um, this is pretty significant changes, and I know we had community input, but I'm curious about um, what the residents, the property owners, the senior centers thought specifically about any of these. Do they have direct input? Sure, yes, they absolutely did. I will also say Kim Lee Horn was also a part of all of those conversations as well. Um, we had significant conversations with both the Lomac and Red Tree properties, definitely the Red Tree properties, which is the Knob Hill Shopping Center, because it most affects their property. And we had long discussions about the right turn in in their entrance by the car wash, um, about their egress from their center. And we made modifications to those comments. Um, I will say the opposite, the um, Crossroads Loop property, um, had less comments on this particular intersection, but did have concerns about cut through traffic on their property and things that they could do to limit that. Um, and then the property with the Dairy Queen, we also spoke with that property owner and she was considering potential modifications to her parking area to make it flow better in that intersection. Um, in the original options one, two, and three, um, is it safe to assume we already did option one with the signage, or is this different signage at this point? Because we put in blinky signs. Um, there's some additional signage and striping over and above what you have now. So the, there's no pedestrian warning flashing beacon, so the little yellow one. And also, I don't believe there's actually bike, uh, green bike crossing striping either. Okay. Um, and then can you move to the slide with the 32 points of... There's, um, keep going, there's, oh, back one, yep. Almost, Almost. I don't know, I am lost, I don't know where it is. Um, okay, and no, there's more, I think, Margo, you're, you're on it, what, what page number is that? Page 26. Thank you. Um, so in regards to option two, the road diet, the preferred option, the 32 points of um, conflict. So when we brought this to, um, to staff to bring forward, 
my highest concern, and I think the rest of the councils, was safety. Um, looking at this, um, is 32 points of conflict the like? Is this the least, the best we can we can do? And you mentioned that we didn't have enough funding for lights. Um, and when I remember a lot of our community coming in, I mean, their basic request was just blinky lights and then just light the area better, which seemed to me to be really simple. This is an extreme version of it. Um, but so my question is, do you think there's, if by adding more lights, would that comp those 32 conflict points reduce? Um, no, it would not. Um, it would... So lighting would in, enhance the visibility of especially people crossing or even vehicles or bicycles, right? The conflict point, a conflict point is where the movement of any mode of transport crosses each other. So a car crosses a pedestrian path, a car crosses a bicycle path, a bike crosses a pedestrian path. So basically anybody that will cross lines in their movement, that's a potential conflict point. And if there's an accident, it will happen in one of those conflict points. What we did from to taking it from 41 to, uh, to the 32 is we've basically done a couple of things, right? We've removed the through lanes, right? And that brings it, and really the 32 is about the minimum we can do with this layout, because if you want to do more, you've got to move somebody away. That means you take away maybe a pedestrian crosswalk, but you don't want to do that. Or you take away a bike lane, you don't want to do that. Or you take away a car turning lane, you don't want to do that. Um, but what is not reflected in this is the fact that we are shortening the crossing distance and also the fact that we are taking an extra lane away on bay avenue the decision making for a pedestrian or a bike or a car is so much less ambiguous because if i stop right now i need to look for the car next to me to the left to the right people crossing people will start moving and then they stop in the middle of the intersection the simplification of the intersection here um, makes that decision making for the driver and for the pedestrian for the cyclist much easier. Um, and, and you mentioned the the single lane. How far along does that go? When does it open back up? I didn't see. I there's a lot of slides. So <clears throat> so going northbound, so towards the freeways to the left, it opens up immediately after the intersection, right? Okay, going. Southbound, so going towards um, Capitola Avenue, you will see because right now the lane actually drops right after the intersection. So we're just dropping it earlier and it continues to be one lane going down to Capitola Avenue. Does that add an additional conflict point for people having to merge back or merge out into two lanes? I'm just wondering what the... In the northbound direction, it is a diverge. There's no conflict. The vehicles just move over, right? They just, one goes left and one goes right. There's no conflict. Okay. This may not be my last question, but I'll do, say it's my last one for now. Um, this is more for staff and for the last slide of next steps. Um, this quick build is a temporary, um, it, it's temporary. And can you give me, so it says spring 2024 to summer for us to evaluate the, the period. Are you, is this organization evaluating are we opening up for input from the community for their own you know evaluation what does that look like so evaluation means a combination of traffic data which would yes also be completed by kimley horn but then also community feedback as part of that evaluation and seeing what the level of service really is versus how people feel about it versus any accidents we may have had during that time okay all right that's all thank you Um, thanks, Eva, for asking those. Um, I had a question about, um, since there's the other entrance into the Knob Hill parking lot closer to the freeway, um, is there going to be any conflict with traffic backing up? And, like, do you see people trying to cut through that way? Or, I, you know, there's going to be pe pedestrians in the parking lot and things, too. So I don't know how that works, usually. So um, people coming from the freeway will have that right turn pocket getting into the car wash driveway, if they call it that, right? Right now, it's a through lane and another through lane. So you've got two through lanes. So we're turning the one through lane into a right turn pocket, which will probably um, encourage more people because they may wait longer at the stop sign. So we believe that more people will actually use that right, use that right turn pocket to get into 
we use the car wash driveway to go to Nobel. Okay. And then is there worry about traffic backing all the way up to the off ramp? It it will. It will because um, it does now, right? And when it gets in the peak periods and when it gets really busy, um, but it's not the whole, you know, for a full hour or full two hours, but there will be periods where it will back up. Um, the main reason being is you've got the freeway ramps being um, managed by traffic signals and they have a higher capacity and you have the stop sign here and it has a lower capacity for managing vehicles. So that's why Derek made the point of, you know, there will be an operational, uh, operations will be worse here, right? But the benefit is safety. Okay, thank you. I just have a couple quick questions. Um, we've heard a lot about level of service. Is there any VMT impact on this due to this project one way or the other? Uh, no, no, no VMT impact. Okay. Um, and then I guess I'm also wondering if there's any consideration about because of the potential backup of crossroads loop becoming a cut through and is that going to see an additional increase in traffic from people trying to avoid the backup on Bay Street? Great question. Yes, it could. And we have we had a discussion with the owners about taking some measures which we will work with the city and the owners on on crossroads loop to discourage cut through and it could be putting in a little speed ump, slowing it down, um, things like that. Great. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I think that's my only question. Thank you so much. All Thank right. you. I, I really don't have any questions because I had the pleasure <clears throat> working with you guys over this. I, I got a lot of good education from you, so thank you. Thank you. All right, we will open it up to public comment. If there's any member of the public that would like to address the council on this item, now is the time. Hi, welcome. Hi, um, my name is Adrian West. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple of recent experiences I had in that intersection. Um, they both have to do with me going towards the direction of Gales and being stopped at the intersection. The first occurrence was uh, there were three cars in line ahead of me, all the way across. A pedestrian was crossing from Pete's, going across the street, and the car just ahead of me, I was in that far right-hand lane, the car just ahead of me saw her, stopped and waited. The two cars next to her were taller cars. Their line of vision, dependent on how far someone's put into the crosswalk and how tall the vehicles are, you can't, they couldn't see her and two cars nearly hit this woman. So then I reached out to Ms. Khan, and I said, can you meet me down here, and can we just look at this? And I presented the idea to her that maybe we angle the crosswalk, so perhaps we could create more of a line of sight for vehicles that are, you know, we can't control that some vehicles push farther into the intersection. We can't control that some vehicles are taller next to a vehicle that's very short. And that all is a factor in how you see the pedestrians, especially on that side, because it's not downhill like coming from Gales. So we talked about that. She presented it to the engineers, and they gave reasons why that wouldn't fit. And that's all fine and good. I'm all about the safety. Well, today, I had a very similar experience. Again, same direction. Um, the person who was crossing the car next to me was way taller and I couldn't see anything in the crosswalk. And I thought to myself, well, what do I do here? It's our turn to go. Do I just trust that they aren't seeing someone cross from their direction, or are they gonna hit someone and they're not being paying attention? So I think we're kind of missing something in this equation about line of sight. Can everyone see the pedestrians, especially on that, that particular side? And also, um, enforcement, it, it's clear to me that people aren't adhering to the laws and the rules of the road. People are pulling way far into the crosswalk at all different uh, lengths into the crosswalk, which creates another hazard for people. Um, the stop bar or there's a stop, a white line before the crosswalk where people are supposed to stop, that never happens. And people are currently basically running the right-hand side as a yield into Knob Hill. That's what's currently happening. And I don't know what part of the improvements you guys are speaking of will change that, but I reached out to see if we could get more patrol down there because I feel like if you start ticketing people, maybe they'll pay attention to what the rules are. But as it currently stands, people are just blowing through those signs right and left. 
So I just wanted to bring that piece to the attention of the council to make sure that's considered, um, especially for now, because we haven't changed anything other than the flashing stop signs, which I really appreciate what's doing. Thank you. Thanks. Any other public comment? Come on up to the podium. State your name for the record if you'd like it recorded correctly in the minutes. Hi, My name is Catherine Parker. Ooh, so I hadn't planned to talk, but I think one of you brought up a really good point that um, I live further down in Capitola, and I don't think there was any um, outreach in terms of other people living in close areas, which I would really appreciate in the future because we use that intersection a lot. Anyway, what happens in the morning, and I see it every day, is when it backs up from uh, Monterey, coming towards Nob Hill, people turn right on Rosedale, zoom up Hill Street. You mentioned maybe people going through the Nob Hill parking lot. I do think that will happen. It already happens. And I think that'll happen more. I really appreciate the crosswalk near the DMV with the flashing lights. Because then if you can't see somebody walking through because the lights are flashing, you know they're supposed to at least stop. So those are just two comments. Thanks. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Alexis Konovich, and I'm a resident of SoCal. I live within a mile of the intersection at Bay and Hill, and I drive through it often on trips to Knob Hill or heading into Capitola. Um, I'm also a local lead with Stronger Santa Cruz, which is a chapter of Strong Towns. Uh, that's a nationwide organization that, among many things, advocates for safe and inclusive street design. So um, anyone who regularly passes through Bay and Hill will tell you that this intersection's hallmark is confused drivers, near misses, and occasionally tragic accidents. This norm has become all too acceptable here, and I think it, at many intersections in the city. Um, in my nine to five job, I work in the space of human computer interaction. Um, I design digital, digital experiences that help people accomplish tasks with ease. And with over a decade in the field, I've learned that blame for frequent user errors doesn't always lie with the people using the product, but within the design itself. Um, this concept is something that's really important. Um, engineers at NASA, for example, understand that poor design can have disastrous consequences. NASA knows that tasks must be designed with relentless clarity, allowing humans to focus on what they're trying to do without distraction. In short, great design drastically lessens the potential for human error. Without this guiding principle, the loss of human life would be much greater. So in a car-centric place like Capitola, it's critical that we apply these same design principles to our own streets, where thousands of cars pass through every day. When near misses and deathly accidents are the norm, the blame cannot rest squarely with drivers because we've intentionally designed a chaotic intersection with nine lanes of traffic feeding into crosswalks frequently used by seniors. So it's really easy to see why drivers would be overwhelmed and distracted trying to navigate it. On dozens of occasions, I've seen that confusion manifest as frustration with drivers dangerously gunning through completely out of their own turn. I really applaud the actions that Capitola has already taken to improve safety in this intersection, and I know we can do more. We're off to a really good start, but the intersection will remain dangerous until it is addressed with real infrastructure and proven safety designs. I recommend simplifying the amount of lanes from nine to five, as mentioned, so that drivers have less distractions. This will allow them to more easily focus on the task of safely maneuvering their car through the intersection. Additionally, adding planters or something more protective than paint to separate vehicles from pedestrians and bikers would have a massive positive impact on the safety of those not traveling by car. Many cities around the country have provided excellent templates for safe street design that would provide dozens more ideas about how to improve the Bay and Hill intersection. I urge the council to boldly prioritize the safety of our community while we build, continue to build these improvements. Thank you. Thanks for the time. Hi, welcome. Hi, my name is Paula Bradley. I'm a resident of Capitola and a cyclist. And um, I had mostly questions, one comment. So hopefully somebody can answer. I, I 
didn't really hear any details about how this quick build is going to be evaluated. I mean, you know, talking to the public that I heard that, but you know, are there going to be some kind of car counts or some kind of qualitative data? Um, I'm concerned about what the results are going to be like. Um, and I applaud doing this. I think it's the right thing to do. I was wondering when the corridor study would be complete. I assume that's down the road from um, after this quick build is going to be come and gone, but but I don't know. And I I would like to support the option too. I think that uh, the road diet, the better bike lanes, the narrower lanes for pedestrians to have to cross um, is the right way to improve the intersection. Um, I was wondering why the separated bike lane was in the particular location it is. Is that just the only place that it would fit to have a buffered bike lane um, approaching the Knob Hill intersection? And then, uh, let's see. Yeah, so I, I think that's pretty much my comment on that. So I support the option too. I think improving safety for bicyclists might reduce the number of vehicles used overall in the city. So the more safe it is to ride a bike, the less need for vehicles. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi there, I'm Doug Lay. I'm the uh, managing partner of Rectory Partners, the owner of the Knob Hill Center. And I just wanted to begin by saying uh, thank you for doing this work. Uh, we fully support the recommendations uh, that you've received and have been very concerned for a long time about the safety of this intersection. Uh, we participated in the, in the comments and we met a couple times with Kim Lee Horn, who I will note as an aside that uh, we've worked, run into, encountered Kim Lee Horn on a number of occasions over the last 20 years. Their work is excellent. You should really trust what they're telling you. And just to give you an example of that, although Frederick should probably address these questions on the safety questions that came up earlier, one of the things that is happening, and he persuaded us was very important, is the right turn lane that people were just described as being a yield and not a stop is going away. So that's one important thing at that intersection that will disappear, and we're supportive of that. Uh, there, and there will only be, because of the elimination of lanes coming into the cent, that intersection, the, the sight lines will be va vastly improved. It'll be easier to see uh, whether somebody's in the intersection and also just what the other cars are doing. I do want to emphasize a couple things here. One of them is this is temporary. And I know you all probably have this experience. People talk about it being temporary and that it becomes permanent. This shouldn't become permanent. Uh, it should be worked with. It should be looked at. But it should be revisited as part of the overall study this quarter because I can guarantee you what is going to happen, and we talked about this in the presentation, the queue back to the freeway is going to get worse. Mm -hmm. That is going to create more frustration with people trying to get out of our center, turn onto, onto bay, all those kinds of things. And all I can say is, and I'm not suggesting that there's any fault here, but this intersection has been identified as a problem for a very long time in terms of traffic flow. And recommendations that were made decades ago to put, a, to put a light here to try to deal with that. I'm not saying it should be a light. I'm not trying to advocate. I think it should be studied. But I just strongly encourage you to keep pushing on the overall study of the street to improve the flow and the safety overall for everybody, because I think that's in the best interest of the community. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thanks. Uh, my name's Elliot Campbell. Uh, thank you so much for all the work that you all are doing on the safety of Bay. Uh, and just to follow up on the amount of time, I was a kid in the 80s biking up and down that road to SoCal Elementary and New Brighton Middle School. And uh, it always seemed like a problematic place to me. Uh, now I'm an adult and I've got some kids that are biking up and down that road. And so I am so excited to see what you're doing. 
I really hope um, we can do better than what the county's done, which is putting paint on the ground. We'd love to see, at least in our household, a physical separation between the cars and the bikes. Um, we'd love to see bike lanes that don't have car doors that swing open into them, knock people into the road, and then they get run over. So those are two things that we talk a lot about in our household and how we navigate down that road. Um, but uh, yeah, I just want to thank you again for the work you're doing. Thank you. Hey, y'all. John from Strong Town Santa Cruz, or Stronger Santa Cruz. It's our new nonprofit name. I got to remember that. Uh, so if I recall correctly, we also had a pedestrian hit in 2014 at that intersection, and a police officer was then hit while responding at the same intersection. So we saw a police officer and a pedestrian hit within 15 minutes at that intersection in 2014. All right, so... Uh, Let's talk about Vision Zero. Vision Zero is an approach where councils like y'all prioritize humans over cars arriving at their destination a few minutes earlier. Vision Zero is often treated as a pipe dream, but places like Hoboken, New Jersey, a city which embraced Vision Zero a decade ago, hasn't had a traffic fatality in seven years. Our main school visitor route in Capitola is the Bay Corridor, and it's a mess, and it has been for decades now. Uh, this quick build smart design upgrade only has one downside, and that is that it will slightly increase traffic. But that is only because the Roundabout and Bay and Capitola Ave staff has long advised for, and we have already spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on designing, is still being delayed by a handful of local interests. Tonight we are begging y'all to care about humans more than cars, embrace the future cities all over the world have. Tell staff this project is good. Nine lanes to seven lanes is a great start, but paint and plastic are not infrastructure. Please direct staff to place planters at the crosswalks. Uh, Stronger Santa Cruz will definitely help build them, and I bet Rack Capitola would too. Thank you for your time. Any additional public comment on this item? Hi, welcome. Great, Travers. So it sounds like the changing of the lanes, that's an issue, making these points of collision less with cars. But the lighting there, I know we're, we've are we talked about that. I make the right turn to go to my mom's house from Knob Hill after shopping for it at night, and I'm going towards Gales, and it just seems funny there. Now, if, if the lane, the, the bollard, or, you know, it's kicked out and I have to go wider, would that help? Maybe it'll help see a pedestrian, but something seems weird there, and... I don't, you guys know a lot more than I do, but looking at the amount of looms and light in various areas, um, right there where my mother-in-law got hit and luckily lived, and even back on the Hill Street extension um, or crossroads where my friend got killed, I just hope you can do light analysis, because um, we're kind of talking, I, I don't know enough about this, but different issues, and I appreciate the limiting of points for people down to 38, I guess, or a uh, 32, I believe it was, but there could be other issues there. Uh, so night versus day. And then, of course, people getting angry and taking that crossroad um, or Hill Street, I'm saying this right, extension, even with speed bumps, the four buys will fly over those. I mean, so there's just a whole lot to look at. You guys have the best people to help you and uh, appreciate what you're trying to do. But um, something about the light there, at least at that right turn over to Gales from Knob Hill seems just funny to me at my age of 62. So thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Seeing none, we'll bring this back to council and we'll start with deliberation and comments on this end. Well, again, I'd like to say I did have the advantage of working with Kimberly Horn and I learned a lot and we talked about a lot of different things. Um, on all the options, option two is by far the best. Limiting the, uh, the lanes, making it easier to see the pedestrians, more room for bicyclists, and on and on and on. Um, I'm not concerned about the level of service. It's people come off the highway and they, they, they're trying to get home and everybody's just going too fast. So for the little inconvenience of, of the traffic, it's worth it with option two. I think I have a couple questions. <laughs> okay. Um, so we mentioned 
in the presentation that lighting was discussed, but it's not really included in the budget is of the project. Is it, it, it that's been made a big point by a lot of people. So I want to see what the possibility of including some type of illumination, what that looks like. I hear you and I hear everybody and I agree, right? So there's lighting only on one corner right now and I think that's why the confusion is also, you can see like one corner, not the other one, right? The only challenge with lighting is <clears throat> we've got to order poles, you've got to do foundations, it takes time, those don't get delivered as quickly. So maybe an option is, and we haven't discussed this, so this is off the cuff here, is to um, maybe order the lighting in the meantime, go ahead and install these quick build improvements, but have the lighting on a slightly longer schedule, right? And mm -hmm. still have lighting installed. We could still Im install the lighting in sort of an ultimate location or, you know, it, just, it needs to be looked at further, but that may be an option. Sure, yeah, thank you for that. Um, along the lines of the lighting, uh, the yellow blinking signs, is that going to be included in the pavement of the crosswalk? Or is that just the sign itself that's gonna be lit up? It's just the signs that's gonna be lit up. Yeah. Because it's pretty expensive to, those, those are not too expensive. Those are, are lower cost. But in, in the pavement? Pavement lighting, yes, that's yes. expensive, especially maintenance, um, and they don't last. Okay, and then to sort of touch on a question from the public, um, once this is implemented, you'll sort of circle back and do the same type of study you did for loss of service and things like that. Okay, Thank great. Thank you. Thank we'll probably also have a look at, so there's another one, and um, again, a little bit off the cuff. So we... We know of all these conflict points right now, but there's analysis that we call near misses. And those are all these things that, oops, I almost hit the car or I hit a pedestrian. We will do similar analysis afterwards, right? And once it's installed and see how the near misses have reduced. I have actually another question for you. Um, with the lane reduction, does that help with that line of sight issue that was brought up? And absolutely. <clears throat> so right now we have three lanes in, 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 in sort of northbound and southbound direction, right? So the lady did a great explanation. So let's say I'm driving a mini and I'm on the curb lane and I drive a big four by four pickup truck and I'm on the inside lane. I cannot see if a pedestrian is crossing from the left, right? What we'll have now is only the one lane. So if there is somebody in the left turn pocket, yes, they may still uh, block our view. But we, but we can always wait till they go or we go, right? But there's definitely the elimination of one of those sideline problems. Mm -hmm. The other big benefit is, um, I wonder if we can bring the, the, the um, image up again. We are pushing these, the pedestrian walk, the bulbs, into the intersection, right? What that does is the pedestrian now actually is stepping sort of into the street, if you can think about it. It's not really stepping into the street, but they are moving out of that sidewalk position. So they can see cars better, and cars can see them better. Right. So right now, um, can we go to the one that shows the existing and the, and, and the one side by side? Uh, there we go. So a pedestrian is standing, let's say across from Pete's and I go um, towards Crossroads Shopping Center, right? <clears throat> I'm standing behind, um, on, on the left corner there, the, the sort of the bottom left corner, right? If you look at where the pedestrian will stand, they will probably stand where the blue is, right? So they're stepping off the curb and into the street. So you have far better sight of the pedestrian. The pedestrian will have better sight of vehicles as well. At what point do we get to color, pick the colors and the designs? So the staff report mentions that it's ideal to have these not as much as I'm public works and love solid blue, <laughs> um, that it is ideal to do some kind of artistic motif. It makes people notice it. It makes it more like there is a change here. Um, the recommendation of the staff report is to consult with the chair of the um, Art and Cultural Commission, um, knowing that we want this to be a quick build and have this installed quickly. It might be a little prohibitive to have like a whole hearing about it with the Art and Cultural Commission. But that is also an option. Okay. Um, Thank you, those are all my questions. Um, so just just for comments, you know, again, this came to us because of a safety, of safety reasons. And my priority is definitely um, ensuring the safety of our community members and our pedestrians and our bicyclists. Um, and I think that the community's pri priorities may vary or differentiate through this process as we, um, especially as we see an increase of traffic. 
I think we're going to have to be prepared here um, for that feedback as it comes in. Um, but for me, it's pri making the priority of safety, and I really appreciate the, the um, information today or brought to us today. Um, I liked our speaker's uh, comments on the, the study and the analysis. I think that's going to be really important. Um, you mentioned a 12-month spread or analysis. You know, if the community comes back six months in and they, it's just terrible, which it won't be, um, how quick can we get rid of it? The whole point is this be relatively quickly removed or modified. Definitely we can okay. feed back and do some modifications and see if that alleviates some of it. It gives us the opportunity to do more than one configuration or remove it altogether. Okay, yeah. I mean, you use the word off the cuff. Um, so I know staff doesn't like that, but sometimes we do when we need to problem solve. Um, okay, so if we can just bring up the options again on the screen. I don't know what slide it is. I'm, yeah, so I'm happy, there we go. Um, I'm happy to make a motion with um, option two, the road diet, as presented by um, Kimberly Horn this evening and staff. Um, and then also I'd like to, for staff to look into ordering the lighting in the meantime um, to help, help alleviate some of at least my concerns and what we heard from the community. I will second that. All right, we have a motion and a second for sake of discussion. I'm gonna, uh, I have a couple comments or questions as well. Um, can you bring, can you bring back the picture again that we just had up? Yeah, no, yep, that one, thank you. It looks, it looks like the um, green bike striping doesn't continue into the other side of the intersection. Is that the case? Is there gonna be any kind of, because we've, we've got color, we've got paint and bollards on the side of the intersection leading away from the freeway. And then by the time you get through, we don't have that anymore. Is that correct? So we, <clears throat> so the intent of the green striping here is to indicate a conflict area between bikes mm -hmm. and vehicles, right? And that's okay. that's what those little green blocks do. Mm -hmm. Once you reach the bike lane on the other side, right, we have the bike symbol and you're in a bike lane, right? So we don't have the conflicts anymore. So that's why the, that specific striping is only in the intersection. Right, but before it, the, we have the blue and the bollards, correct? Yep. And, and we don't have that after that. Um, oh, if we go further back? No, no, no. Stay on this slide, please. Stay on this slide. I'm so, talking about where it says, where that box says lane transition for road diet with one through lane on Bay Avenue. That strip of blue with the white dots in it, is that not paint with bollards? It could be paint with bollards, yes. Yes, that's actually. actual could be, but is that what it is yes, in this plan? Yes. yes. That is paint with bollards. So what I'm... Protected bike lane. Exactly. So what I'm saying is uh, once yeah. you get through the intersection, there's no longer a protected bike lane, correct? Not in this design, no. Why? There's a bus pull out in that location. Oh, that's right. Yep. Okay. Um, can we can we paint it anyways? Can we still paint the bike lane even if even we, though we can't have bollards due to the bus lane? We could do a buffered stripe. Uh, okay. Right. So it's a, it's a, it's a it's a diagonal striping. Yeah. To enhance it, that can be done. If we could inc if we could add that, I I think that would be a really good idea since there's suddenly not going to be anything. Yeah, any color or anything. And since we're removing that option as a lane for cars, I want to make it very clear that that's no longer an option of, of a lane for cars, um, which I think is a good idea, though, because that's kind of the drag race lane right now, right? That's where people are trying to, like, race each other to get to where it divides so that they can, they can get over. Um, okay. Uh, and then there was a question from uh, the public about how it is going to be evaluated. I guess you kind of already asked this um, about in terms of qualitative data, like what what's going to be collected other than level of service and the points of contact. So, so it's going to be yeah level of service, and then uh, we will do observations, field observations about the movements, and we'll probably hear from the public again. Mm -hmm. And then, like I said, the near misses. Those are a, a, a very strong indication of uh, the, the conditions approved from that whole perspective of does it get safer. Okay, thank you. Um, Jessica, I noticed in the staff report uh, it mentioned that the forthcoming Bay Avenue corridor study is going to go from the moment people get off the freeway all the way until they hit um, Monterey Avenue, correct? That whole, that whole intersection. Will that traffic study consider a light at this intersection, a stoplight at this intersection? 
Will that be part of the consideration? Yes, definitely. Because okay, we're looking at roundabouts and yes. that would be an option too? It would, all of the options would be considered um, depending kind of on your feedback. What would be thoroughly studied might vary. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, before we move on to item 8C, we have four more items on the agenda. So I'm going to go ahead and request um, that staff move the special events and park regulations item to our next agenda, and we'll take that next time. Uh, and then we're going to take a, a three-minute bio break. And Mr. Machado, I know you've been waiting patiently. You're up next. Thank you. What, you just came to watch? Oh yeah, okay. doing good. I had some technical difficulties in the beginning, which I felt. Okay.
And we're back. All right, let's go to item 8C, the Zone 5 Drainage Master Plan. And I'll turn it over to staff. This is my last item for the evening. All right. <laughs> You've done your time. <laughs> okay. um, so this informational item is uh, the accumulation of a longstanding project with Zone 5, the county, and the city of Capitola. It's a project that builds and expands on a previous master plan of Zone 5, which is us here in Capitola, SoCal, and the community of Live Oak is an operation and management, evaluated operation and management and capital needs. And the intent is to lead to a Prop 218 process this spring slash summer. And for this whole thing to wrap up at the end of the calendar year. So for more details, the prime uh, consultant on this project, Schaff and Wheeler, Dan Schaff is here to give you all an update. All right, good evening. I'm Dan Schaff with Schaff and Wheeler, uh, here to present the Zone 5 uh, drainage master plan. A little history on this. Uh, Shuffle Wheeler did Zone 5 and Zone 6 master plans back in about 2015, but the city capital did not participate in that. So this is new uh, data for city capital. So slide. Real quickly, uh, what I'm going to talk about in the next about 10 minutes is the, the team and the project and how we did things and what we discovered and what we recommend and where to go from there. Next slide. A uh, fairly large team because we're taking on more than just the capacity of the pipes and the streams. We are also looking at the operations and maintenance procedures of uh, the, both uh, Zone 5, the county areas, and the city, and looking at the condition, which is really important, of the infrastructure. They, a lot of this is underground and out of sight, out of mind, so we spend a lot of time looking at current condition of the pipes and culverts and channels, uh, and then uh, also uh, funding is a big key to this. So we have two financial firms, uh, so fairly large team. Next slide. Uh, so uh, how did we do this? Can you actually move those? The, is there a way to move the, oh, there we go. <laughs> so, so what are the, the goals? The goals are really to create a sort of holistic master plan of zone five, and that includes the city of Capitola and we also want to um, provide information. I mentioned the, the capacity of the system. We wanna make sure it's safe during large storm events. We wanna make sure the infrastructure is reliable, meaning not falling apart or cracking or failing. And we want to make sure that the maintenance crews are doing their work most, the most efficient way possible with the funds given. Um, and so with that, next slide. How do we do that? Well, for capacity, we looked at two things. We looked at a 25-year storm for all the pipes, the, we're calling it the regional system, the larger pipes within uh, the county and Capitola, and then a 100-year event, so sort of like a FEMA-type floodplain in the uh, channels and uh, culverts. Uh, for condition, we spent a lot of time uh, with robotic camera CCTV, uh, you know, taking photos and video of the pipe, seeing what's going on, a lot of topside to, uh, you know, just open up manholes, looking at how things were, if there's sediment or cracks or those type of things. And then operations, a lot of times by NCE spent with the actual operations staff and seeing how do they work and that forms the plan for how to improve that. Uh, and then lastly, funding, uh, you know, how, how, is all, how is this gonna be paid for? How is it currently being paid for? And how do we move from, on from there? So a little bit of the results, uh, you all know where Capitola is, but uh, what we're looking at, this is the pipes for the 25-year uh, event. And when we see red, as, as engineers, it means the capacity of the system is limited. And you can see in Capitola, there's not a whole lot of, first of all, there's not a whole lot of what we're calling regional pipes. A lot of it's smaller infrastructure, uh, but we do see some red dots there, uh, um, kind of very close to here. Um, on the kind of extension of Noble Gulch where before it gets into Soquel Creek, okay? And then uh, we, ma we made recommendations. So this is the entirety of Zone 5, but if you look there in Capitola, there is quite a significant amount of red uh, lines uh, really close to where we are, and that is to make the improvement of getting water into Soquel Creek from uh, Noble Gulch. Condition, I always think people find these fascinating. So we, a lot of video, a lot of uh, photography under 
see what's going on in all those pipes. And for the most part, concrete pipes are in pretty good condition. There are some sediment here and there. We find some offset joints, uh, but overall not too bad. What tends to be a problem is metal pipes. So core grade metal pipes tend to uh, deteriorate a lot quicker. And then at outfalls, we see, tend to see problems as well. So uh, next slide. Okay, so maintenance. This, this was a huge undertaking and we did not look at this in 2015, but we really wanted to um, kind of look at the system and how things were being operated currently and then how could that be improved? And just kind of ballpark figures, about $2 million is being spent on operations currently and about a million dollars in MPDS. Or I should say that's what's needed. So there's about $3 million in needs of keeping this system uh, throughout the entirety of Zone 5, not just the city of Capitola. And we looked at the needs of how many people it's gonna take and what kind of equipment it takes. Uh, and so from it's very reactionary right now. There's a problem. Let's fix it. Let's go maintain it. Uh, the new system is really to, to be proactive. So use data to figure out if, almost before it happens, you know, we can predict where things are going to happen. And that happens through tracking of data. So it's getting the current staff uh, trained to learn to use these tools. And so some of these things don't cost money. Some of them do, like more equipment, more people would cost money. But um, And so fo focusing the resources that are available, we don't know exactly what resources there will be available, but focus them on the areas that have basically the greatest return on investment. And that's a really important thing. Uh, and this system will just get better and better over time. It almost becomes um, uh, repeatable and um, predictive. And that's really uh, a big change from being reactionary. So financially, what does all this cost? Uh, quite a bit. Um, and you can see the breakdown here. Capital actually has a lot more um, capital improvement projects than sort of the county. We did want to, we knew you'd ask, like, what's the difference between the county and the city, even though it's all within one district, is there's larger capital projects that need to be done within Capitola and more operations side things in the county and condition. So that, that was sort of the, the bigger difference. Um, and so uh, real quickly, um, there are, for those who don't know, there, there's lots of funding mechanisms. Um, stormwater is not a utility in California. Rest of the Western states it is. So it's much more difficult to have a rate or a fee for storm drainage. So there are different ways to fund storm drainage. So, you know, starting at the general fund, just pay as you go on these projects. Uh, impact fee, so any kind of development that has an impact would pay for their direct impact. So that's, those are sort of the more simple ones, but then we get into property taxes, property related fees, um, assessments, and those require voter, votes of either property owners or um, the public. Uh, then, always good to mention, there's, there are other sources of funding besides just a tax or these is, um, you know, there's grants available and the grants usually go to more green uh, or climate resilient uh, projects. So that's very important to know. And we keep that in mind when we're developing these capital projects. Uh, partnerships. So we have Caltrans, we have state parks, we have other uh, agencies. Are there places where we can work together? I mean, obviously the county and the city are working together, so that can happen. Then, you know, it can happen with other uh, groups as well. And um, again, having um, development pay their fair share is always um, a good thing. Next. So uh, recommendations for uh, the uh, capacity is, you know, these are huge projects, many of them millions and millions of dollars, but they need to be prioritized. and. As funds become available, we know what which projects need to happen. Um, as as that happens, also I think studying alternatives because there, there's sort of multiple ways to solve a lot of these problems, and we're always looking for uh, the the cheaper. I think we I heard earlier that you know the, the council is very uh, budget conscious, and so these pro these are large public uh, infrastructure projects, and they need to be. Um, 
alternatives need to happen. I think that's the comment I heard from the last two presentations is looking for alternatives. And that exa is exactly what we want to do. We want to do what we call value engineering, looking for alternatives for these. Um, and then, um, yeah, next slide. Yeah, so on the operation side, um, kind of I presented what the ultimate project could be, but it can be phased based on funding. So uh, if more new equipment and new staff aren't readily funded, we certainly can take a better, uh, current staff can do a better job of recording information, creating sort of database of, you know, locations of where things happen and so that we're starting to gain that knowledge to we can predict where uh, issues going to happen and maybe do something about those conditions. So, you know, if you're going out to one location 20 times a year, maybe it's cheaper to actually fix that location. Um, so uh, reporting is really the key to that. And there's mechanisms and software to make that very simple. So it's not sitting at a desk um, for hours and hours recording, writing reports. All right, so after all the engineering and all that funding is where it really comes, what it comes down to. And I mentioned some of the mechanisms, but what's the process? And from, this is sort of where we are right now is, you know, we're involving the, the city and the county staff and telling them what we know about the system and what needs to be done. Um, and figuring out as a group, what are the me best mechanisms to use? Because it may be more than one. Uh, and reaching out to the public, because ultimately the public, either property owners or uh, the voters, are going to approve this. So they, they're the, the key to all this happening. Um, we just did this last week. We worked and figured out who really are the large stakeholders in this. Who you know, uh, A fee could potentially be based on impervious surface. So large landowners would have a bigger bill than a single family resident. So, uh, you know, they, they become important stakeholders. Schools uh, are, have a lot of impervious surface. So these, these become uh, very important people to, to talk to, to see, you know, uh, what they're thinking. And the other one is on almost all these storm drain, if it moves into a fee, the ones that have passed in California have almost always had a champion. So someone outside the government who really believes in this and um, you know I'm sure you've heard this before but sometimes it's not the message it's the messenger and sometimes if, if it comes from like a blue ribbon committee or someone else that can really have more weight then people might listen to the same message differently uh, next all right so next uh, I mentioned alternatives analysis you know we, as engineers we're gonna keep looking for ways to Improvements because some of these projects are going to need to happen at some point, especially the ones that may be critical of failing or flooding people. So we're moving right into figuring out alternatives to those for cost and just uh, constructability. Um, one thing that could happen that would make uh, almost like the um, uh, traffic pr uh, project is a monitoring. Where 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 do we see issues? Like keep those track of those and, and sometimes it's in someone's head and just getting that down is you know what what's happening and a lot of cities have gone to, as far as like installing like flow meters like you know how much is it raining and sharing that with citizens so that that's really important um, um yeah and then i keep mentioning the o m program there, there's things in that program that can happen without any additional cost and i think that's really uh a good start and that's going to move towards uh, a better system being maintained and more efficiently and actually optimizing funds being spent for operations and maintenance. Uh, once there's a funding mechanism, you know, we do move into design and hopefully we have really good designs that, you know, the public likes and is aware of and we can move into construction and, and improve these conditions. So um, that's sort of it. Feel free to ask questions. All right. Thank you so much for that presentation. Yeah. Do we have any questions? No? Questions? No? Any questions? No? All right. Oh, Thank you so much for, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. for your presentation. Do we have any public comment on this item? Matt? Anything? No? Okay. All right. Closing public comment. Uh, thank you so much. We appreciate you being here and sharing that with us tonight.
All right. Um, as mentioned, we are moving item 8D, the special events and park regulations, to the next scheduled meeting. So we're going to move on to item 8E, which is our 23-24 mid-year budget report. All right, so our next item this evening is the um, yeah. your 23-24 mid-year budget report. You missed the joke. It's okay. That's, it lo it's done now. It's, yeah, it's too late. It's too late. The moment has passed. Hold it. Um, so just as a summary, our general fund balance summary update, um, currently we still have about $400,000 that we have earmarked for city council goals from the prior fiscal year that we're still working on. In the next slide, I'll go through those. Um, we also have $100,000 set aside for the Employee Down Payment Assistance Program and $954,000 for future capital improvement projects. And we started with $500,000 for um, our contingency. We actually ended the year slightly better than we had projected. So for a total of about $2 million of general fund balance that we have going right now. Uh, next slide, please. As far as the 400,000 for the ongoing projects, 150 is for the community center. And some of these are going right now. We just haven't really started spending much of the cash. So that's why we're pulling this out. Um, funding for city hall options, project that's currently underway. Bluff uh, lift drive study, I think is getting close as long as, as well as the Noble Gulch engineering. Um, fire risk reduction, I think we're working on right now as, as well as the free park bridge is getting close. So all of these things are, are in the works. We're just still carrying over from last year. Um, next slide, please. We can actually punt this slide because this was depending on the outcome of item 8A, which was continued. So we can skip that one. Um, so as far as financial highlights, <clears throat> sales tax is a little below projections by about $300,000. Um, property tax, slightly above. TOT, slightly below. They're kind of offsetting each other right now. All of the revenues and expenditures are tracking pretty close to budget. Our um, fines, parking citations primarily, are down, but there's a lot of extenuating circumstances regarding that. We think that'll pick back up. And then uh, building permits and recreation fees are up this year over the last year. On the expenditure side, everything's tracking fairly close, but we do have a couple of minor amendments that will be requested. Next slide. Um, so just an overview um, on the revenue side, you can see the big hit right there is on the taxes, which is the sales tax being a little behind <clears throat> projections. The um, fines, I think, will pick up, and everything else is kind of washing out. So we're about, I think, a little more than 5% below where we were last year at this time. Um, next slide. But this is pretty typical for where we are this time of year. Um, same can be said for expenditures. Um, we're a little bit, about 3% ahead of where we were last year. That's Pretty much where we thought we would be with a couple of minor tweaks. Um, personnel, again, always shows high this time of year because of the UAL payment we make in July and then kind of amortize. So this is about where we would expect to be on the expenditure side as well. Um, so as far as um, requested budget amendments, we're requesting to reduce our sales tax revenue projection by 300000 We've talked to um, HDL, so we're about 300000 down this point, at midpoint of the year. But we think the rest of the year will be very similar to how it was last year and match up with budget. Um, so we think the 300 reduction will be pretty close. On the expenditure side, <clears throat> we have uh, 75,000 of personnel related things, primarily um, overtime. And those were a couple of big um, investigations by PD as well as some storm response by PD and Public Works. Um, $6,000 for training that we're doing some catch up training. Well, I mean, the pandemic, some of the in-person stuff we couldn't do, so we're still catch catching up on the last bit of that stuff. Um, 28000 for uh, budget amendments, primarily related to supplies, some of it in fleet for just cost increases that we just didn't anticipate, some of the fuel came down, going back up. Um, and then the billing error was <laughs> one of our T1 lines going for PD was actually getting billed to San Benito County Sheriff, so we've fixed that and we're 
pay for that. And they were one of AT and T had a bill going to San Benito County for like two years that we found out about. So, so. did we just have like a, a two year bill that had never gotten paid, or was San Benito County paying it? We were paying it. We were paying it. Did we pay them back? <laughs> yeah, that's what this is. <laughs> So nice oh wait, like so it's, they didn't know it was ours. They just no, thought they it was just, theirs. Yeah, they were paying it, and then at some point, I just question. I'm going to wait for questions, but I'm going to need to know, like, how did they find out that that was that was? I think it was through the 911 center, and we're yeah. all we all contract through the 911 center, so it's a little a little more explicable rather than like just okay. in, in, you know Capitola okay. City Hall in Hollister or something. Thank you. Continue. Uh, so total expenditures are. Um, Increased requests are 130,000. So the um, net impact to the general fund is actually a reduction of about 430,000 for what we thought our projected ending fund balance would be. Um, next slide. We have a couple um, other items, one in the emergency reserve and then some special revenue funds. The um, $80,000 from the emergency reserve was, and this could possibly get reimbursement from FEMA or Cal OES if we get an emergency declared. But that was the, um, I want to say trees and parking spaces that were damaged in the weather there. Um, we have $25,000 for um, general plan, out of that general plan update fund for housing element implementation. And also for um, legal fees related to the housing element, we've been hitting the general fund with all of our legal fees for the housing element. So this is more just a shift of expenditures that have already happened just out of the general fund with the, where the housing element was being paid for. Um, $7,500 for a CDBG grant fund grant application. $10,000 for a home reuse fund for Dakota Apartments, who you all heard from earlier today. And then $30,000 for um, equipment, and this is to replace the runway pump station. Um, so as a summary, if, if approved, this would reduce our estimated fund balance in the general fund by $430 and uh, reduce the estimated fund balance we have at the beginning of this year in the aspect of the emergency reserve and the special revenue fund. Um, the emergency reserve, typically what we do is when we pull out the next year, we program back in so we have a plan to get it back next year. So the next slide. And just by, uh, as a reminder, about two weeks, we start our, our kick off our budget process with goal setting. And then once we get that, um, we get really busy in May and June with uh, next year's budget. And so the recommended action is to receive the mid-year um, budget report and adopt the proposed resolution amending the fiscal year plan. Thank you. Any comments? Thank you. Um, Jim, you said the total ending fund balance would be 430 less. What would the total ending fund balance be? 1.6. Okay, cool. Thank you. Questions? That was your question, too. Questions? Yeah. Um, can you confirm that the adjustment does include the parking meters and that we are going to fix them? It's 50,000 for tree work mm -hmm. on top of the 50,000 that we already had for mostly along Park Avenue. $30,000 for parking uh, pay stations, which is replacing four that were damaged and then also kind of putting one more in our back pocket in case it happens again. And turning them around? I think they're pulling batteries now. I, I believe Sergeant Evans told me that they found by pulling batteries before the storm is going to hit them. I don't know if I know. There's batteries inside the pay stations, and that's what's getting wet when the storms come in and causing the damage and blow and shake it. So we pull everything out. They have Or they're less susceptible to damage. Or we could turn them around and then they wouldn't get hit so dramatically. But um, that's just a thought. Uh, the lights that we just talked about yes. on our previous item, do we need to include that here? I will have to talk with Mike and see where we are budget wise for what we have left in the budget and what the um, quick build is. Yeah. And I don't know what the lights cost, but we'll, we'll figure that out. Okay. Um, and then generally, we kind of get the, the um, in our report, our original goals, and then we always kind of have like the, if we have money during mid-year, we could add things on in terms of our goals. And that wasn't in today's packet, or not today's, but in our, in our council packet. Um, and I don't have those all 
in my brain. I'm just wondering if we have those available. So, you know, when we do our priorities every year, we have like, this is how much money we have. And then there's like some extra projects that council would like to initiate, but we usually talk about those during this time of year budget. Um, do you have that slide? Do we split that up a couple of years ago? If you remember, we used to do the mid year and the goal setting kind of as one hearing and we broke it up starting three. It was a couple of years ago into two separate hearings. So we do the mid year and then we're doing the goal setting where we can look at all the projects from last year. You guys are going to talk about your goals for next year. That's coming up on March. That's not what I'm asking. Yeah, she, I think she's, she's not asking about the goal setting for next year. Typically, we do have, I, I know what you're talking about, that we've changed goal setting as a separate thing, but we've always in mid-year said, this is where we're at. And then that gave us an opportunity for like, you know, in the last six months, if I called you and said, hey, well, can we do this and can we do that? It was usually like, yeah, at mid-year, we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, just from my end jump in if you want from the fact that our community center is so far underfunded and the unknowns that were going into the wharf as we were getting this we didn't think we really had a lot of money mm. talking about i was i thought i was going to be sitting up here saying that we're below our five hundred thousand dollar target and ending ballot and we're at 430 so that's seventy thousand <laughs> now 1.1.6 1. includes five hundred thousand of reserves right yeah so we can't yeah, touch like an operating budget right. Okay, so I'm hearing you say you didn't bring that forward because we have no money to spend. I didn't anticipate having available funding to allocate at mid-year. Okay, that's fair. Thank you. Um, would it be possible at the next budget hearing, can you show the um, timeline again of the next budget, of the budget hearings? And I only ask because it is between when we modify our budget, when we create our budget, and the next time we create a budget, we have people call us all year that are like, can you work on this? Can you work on that? And so I'm thinking, Jamie, that I had called you a couple months ago about hardscaping in the medians and that there was questions about why some of our medians aren't looking so good. And I, I thought that this was the time to say, hey, any chance we can throw 50 grand at some hardscaping and some medians or however much it may cost. So even if that's not tonight, would it be possible on what march 6th yeah sure what do we oh so that For is that, our goal we'll set be, we'll be reviewing the goals that for next that year we haven't finished yet that yeah we're still carrying forward and then start talking about next year's goals. so i'm okay with with that being talking about next year's goals but will we at that meeting have the opportunity to look at our current fund balance and say can we pull some money here and there for projects before next year's budget we can do that Okay. We can do that. I mean, I think at the end of the day, getting through, as Jim said, getting through kind of the wharf and understanding that picture. Yeah. Because as of 24 hours ago, we were looking at like, as Jim said, dropping below. Hundred percent. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. No, I, I understand. We're we're very low. We're not going to have a lot of pet projects that we're going to be able to fund, but I I do want to keep the opportunity for us to look at where we're at and see if there's any places that we can move things around or address things that cost less than we thought or you know whatever the case may be okay okay any more questions any more questions okay uh any public comment on this item seeing none we will bring it back uh and that was just receiving oh uh can we adopt a resolution amending the fiscal year 23 24 budget do we have a motion i move to make a motion i will second we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. We'll move on to our final item, 8F, the 2023-24 CDBG grant application, authorizing staff to prepare and submit an application under the 23-24 Community Development Block Grant Program for the Jade Street Community Center. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, tonight before you is... Uh, Part of our CDBG grant application process is to make sure we have a public hearing. I'm going to keep my presentation short, knowing that there's no public here. So CDBG is um, a way in which the federal government funnels money down to local governance. And we have an opportunity to apply for a grant um, next Friday. And this is fulfilling our requirement of a public hearing. We did this earlier in anticipation of this happening late last year it didn't happen so we're actually going through this exercise one more time just to give the public an opportunity to just to come forth with comments 
The project is for $3.3 million to fund our community center at Jade Street. And um, with that, I'd like to suggest that, uh, um, that you open a public hearing tonight, receive public comment on the grant application, and then we'll move forward with an application next Friday. So thank you. That concludes you. my presentation. Thank you. Uh, questions? No questions? No. All right, we will open up the public hearing on this item. Seeing no one in the room, uh, aside from staff, of course. Um, we'll bring it back to council. I'm sorry, I actually do have a question. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not sorry. Um, do you need any other letters of support from agencies or to make our application shine through in order to get the funding? So we're, um, this first round is very unique. There's $19 million available, and it will be awarded on a first-come, first-serve basis. So I am training with Paul Ashby on how to press the buttons really fast and get our application in, but it's really uh, first-come, first-serve. It's $19 million. We're asking for $3 million. The likelihood is very low. Um, CDBG, there's going to be another round in, they say, in the fall of 2024, where if we don't get this award this round, we'll um, then apply and it'll be a, the typical process where a letter would help. But in this circumstance, I don't think it's necessary. And we're requesting more than we need? No, we're, we could utilize all of these funds. This would... Um, fund the whole interior remodel of the building. I, I know I said I had no questions, but I wonder if it's worth putting a flat number like $5 million in and they say you get three out of it or something like that. 3.3 .3 is the the um, the most you can apply for. Oh, God. So we're maxing it out. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there anything we can do to make our grant more competitive than it already is? There's no competition other than Oh, it's literally it first. first time, first serve. Like, Put it in and they will give you money. Wow. Yeah. I think we should you have to be one of the first probably seven applicants. Wow. And multi departments submit? Yeah. Like could you I, I believe I'm gonna have a login as Capitola wow. and Yeah, we need a bot. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh all right. I'll bring it back to council uh, for a vote. I'll go ahead and adopt the resolution authorizing staff to prepare and submit an application under the 2324 Community Development Block Grant for the Jade Street Community Center. All second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. With that, we are ending tonight's meeting. We are adjourning to a special city council meeting. Uh, March 6th, next, no, not next week, but March 6th, uh, at 4 o'clock. Take note, different time, different date, different time, same place, special meeting. Tuesday, March, no, no, that's a Wednesday. This says adjourn to a special meeting on March 6th. Okay, we're adjourning this one anyways. Good night. <laughs>